This is Audible. Be Mine Forever Written by D.K. Hood Narrated by Patricia Rodriguez Prologue Black Rock Falls, Saturday Fear gripped Lori Turner in a rush of panic. And wrapping her coat around her, she hastened her step along Stanton Road. Night dropped like a curtain, plunging her into darkness in the middle of nowhere. A storm rumbled in the distance, and the first splashes of rain brushed her cheeks. As thunder rolled across the midnight sky, the forest, so beautiful during the day, had become a threatening menace. Within the intermittent flashes of lightning, Shadows moved through the trees like faceless men in long black coats. She dashed on into the night, stumbling on the uneven sidewalk. The cut through to Raven's Way was only a few more yards away. As the ground shook and lightning zigzagged the sky, she glanced over one shoulder at the empty street. Not a soul was out in the storm. Not a single vehicle rode the blacktop. But was she alone? Consumed by the creepy second sense that someone was behind her, she turned into the dark alleyway and hustled along. With each step, tree branches reached out with long, witch-like fingers to drag her into the murky depths. An unfamiliar noise came close by, and she stopped mid-stride to listen. But the only sound came from the wind rushing down the alleyway, a gust whipped up the fall leaves, and they swirled around her, mixed with twigs and dirt. Ahead, she made out the dim glow of streetlights and hurried on. Panic had her by the throat as footsteps sounded on the gravel. Was someone behind her, hidden in the dark? Heart pounding, she took off at a run, burst onto the sidewalk, and headed in the direction of her home. She slowed at the corner and glanced behind her once more at the empty road. As she turned back, the headlights of a vehicle blinded her as it rounded the corner and slowed beside her. Nerves at breaking point, she grasped her backpack to use as a weapon and then sighed with relief at the sight of a familiar face. Want a ride? Looking all around, she fumbled with the door handle and then climbed inside. I'm sure glad to see you. My car wouldn't start, and I dropped my phone, so I had to walk. She fastened her seatbelt and leaned back, closing her eyes. It's kind of spooky tonight with the storm and all. Uh-huh. He turned up a tune on the radio and accelerated at speed. As he flew past her turn and headed back to Stanton, she swallowed hard. Where was he taking her? Unease crawled up her spine. I live out of Raven's Way. Uh-huh. His eyes remained fixed on the road. I saw a deer in the forest a ways back. I want to go see if it's dead. He stopped the vehicle and pointed into the trees. Over there. A thunder rolled, and rain splattered the windshield. She turned to stare into the dark forest. I can't see anything. Surprise. A sing-song voice came from the back seat. The next instant, a band slid around Lori's neck and tightened with force, dragging her up and back in the seat. Pinned by the seat belt and helpless, Lori grabbed at her throat and, fighting for one precious breath of air, opened her mouth in a silent scream. A wad of cloth hit her tongue and filled her mouth with a rancid taste, and then someone dragged her hands away. She couldn't fight. Heart bursting, pain shot through her head. And as her sight moved in and out of focus, she heard a deranged giggle. As the next flash of lightning filled the interior, she stared into the contorted, grinning face of pure evil. Chapter One Sunday He's perfect, maybe too perfect. 
Sheriff Jenna Alton had been scrolling through the applications for a new deputy and had finally found someone suitable. Well, I asked you all to help me find a suitable deputy, and out of the six applicants, this one sure looks interesting. Who found Zach Rio? I asked him to apply. Shane Wolf smiled at her. I'm glad he did. Jenna lifted her gaze to her good friend and Black Rock Falls medical examiner, Shane Wolf. How did you find him? She eyed her friend across the outdoor table she'd set up for a Sunday cookout with her friends. It was a beautiful fall day, and they'd spent a relaxing time enjoying each other's company. Dr. Shane Wolf was a man wearing many hats. As handler for Deputy Dave Kane, an off the grid Special Forces sniper, he had contacts that went to the Oval Office. The proud Texan, who resembled a Viking marauder, was a widower father of three girls. His daughters and his role of medical examiner over three counties in Montana kept him busy. Well, it was Julie. Wolf was referring to his daughter. She mentioned meeting a couple of new kids at the school who mentioned their brother was an LAPD detective. He's been working as a teacher's aide at the high school. Hardly a fitting occupation for a man with his skill set. I checked him out, introduced myself, and asked him if he'd be interested in applying. Wolf smiled at her and sipped his beer. He'd fit in your team just fine. And you have that big house with separate accommodation for a housekeeper or nanny sitting empty. Jenna peered at the image of the young man, Zach Rio, 25, 6'3", dark curly hair, and with skills far beyond what she required in a deputy. She shook her head. I'm not sure. He has a ton of degrees. How did he do all that by 25? She handed the iPad to Dave Kane, her second-in-command and close friend. What do you think, Dave? He sounds too good to be true, and he's overqualified for the job. Why would someone like that want to live in Black Rock Falls? The background check on him revealed a few more details. Kane shrugged. He's the genuine article. Maybe he wants to rest his mind. I can't imagine what it would be like to have a memory like his. Or his IQ. He would have been a child prodigy if someone had recognized his intelligence. He finished a law degree but didn't sit the bar exam because of problems at home. But by that time, he had a few other degrees under his belt. He joined the LAPD and made detective, but after his parents died in a plane crash, things went downhill fast family-wise. So he decided to care for the 16-year-old twins, one of each by the names of Cade and Piper. They were pretty wild, and he needed to get them settled in a different environment. He scratched his cheek and then met Jenna's eyes. A contender for my job, huh? He's also a sharpshooter. Never, <laughs> Jenna laughed. His hobbies are everything and anything to do with media. He'd be an asset at crime scenes and be able to handle the dreaded media releases. That doesn't explain why he wanted to leave the sunshine and come here. California is a big state with plenty of room to move around. Deputy Jake Rowley handed his wife Sandy a plate of food from the grill and dropped into a chair. The kids were staying with their grandma. Wolf leaned back and crossed his legs at the ankles. Well, step, grandma. They'd never gotten along with her. They started getting into trouble at school. He frowned. It often happens after a tragedy. Kids feel lost and take their aggression out on everyone. Zach tried keeping them in the big smoke, but it didn't work out. He figured a complete break and a new start in a backwoods town would straighten them out. He's been here a month now. In Black Rock Falls? Kane pressed two fingers to his forehead. Does he know about this town's reputation? He does now? Wolf shrugged. I've spoken to him and he'd welcome the challenge. He figures he can keep his siblings safe. We've had an influx of twins of late. Sandy. Rowley's wife passed a bowl of salad to her husband. This will make three sets of new twins in town. 
all around the same age and all fraternal. Susie Hartwig at Aunt Betty's mentioned it yesterday. Rio sounds interesting. Suddenly starving, Jenna piled food on her plate. Do you think he'll cope? It's nothing like Los Angeles. Yeah, I do. He'll prefer the slower pace, and there's plenty for him to do around here on his downtime. We have great schools, and he can get involved with the local drama society. I hear he writes plays and directs as well. Wolf glanced around as his daughters emerged from Jenna's ranch house. Surprised, Jenna stared at him. So he's a man of many talents. I like that he has a cultured background. Are you saying we're not cultured? Kane grinned at her and raised a glass of Pinot Noir in a toast. I figure we're doing okay. Look at Julie. She's had her artwork displayed in the town hall. Can't get more cultured than that. Jenna chuckled. I didn't mean to suggest y'all aren't cultured. Now getting back to discussing a new deputy. I want this to be a team decision. And if you all agree, then we'll take him. We need the help, and he's solid. Kane helped himself to a steak and added the trimmings. And we do have a spare SUV cruiser just sitting in the parking lot. It's a yes for me, Rally grinned. I'll be glad to show him around. Great. I'll contact him later. Jenna looked up as Emily, Wolf's eldest and a fine M.E. in the making, sat down at the table along with 16-year-old Julie and Anna, the baby of the family. She looked at the girls. Grab some food before it gets cold. She'd barely finished her meal when the 911 ringtone sounded on her phone. She pushed to her feet and walked away from the table, heading to the house to take notes, if necessary. As she climbed the steps, she accepted the call. 911, what is your emergency? My daughter is missing. The man sounded frantic, and his voice quivered as he spoke. She went to cheerleader practice last night and wasn't in her bed this morning. I figured she'd left early and I'd missed her, but she's not answering her phone. Jenna walked inside the house and heard footsteps behind her. Kane had followed her and dashed past her to the kitchen, his boots clattering on the wooden floor. As she walked through the door, he had a pen and notebook waiting for her on the table. She put the phone on speaker. Okay, I'll need to take down some details. Who am I speaking to? Dr. Bob Turner, out of Raven's Way. His breath was coming fast, as if he'd been running. My daughter is Lori. Lori Turner. Jenna sat down and placed the phone on the table. Okay, Dr. Turner, you're speaking with Sheriff Alton. I'll need your full details and Lori's. How old is she? Sixteen. Turner gave his details. I've been calling her friends, and nobody has seen her since she left practice at the school gym last night. The all-too-familiar shiver of unease slipped down Jenna's spine, and she exchanged a meaningful look with Kane. Okay, and what time was this? Around nine. Nine-thirty last night. Turner heaved a long sigh. I didn't notice her missing until this morning. I called her phone, and it's not responding. I went out to hunt her down this morning in case she'd slipped out before I woke. I went to Aunt Betty's cafe, and then I checked around town again, but I couldn't find her. With her mind running down her list of the necessary procedures in a missing persons case, Jenna stared into space for a beat. Does she own a vehicle? Yeah, but that's not here either. Dr. Turner sounded frantic. No one has seen it, and it's distinctive. It's a 1950 Ford pickup and painted fire engine red. Jenna made notes. Okay, we can put out a bolo for the truck. Does she have a boyfriend she might be with? Nope. She broke up with a boy by the name of Wyatt Cooper a couple of weeks ago. I called him, and he hasn't spoken with her since. It had been such a relaxing Sunday. Jenna stared at Kane, and his face was grim. She gave herself a mental shake. Okay, Dr. Turner, I'm on my way. She disconnected and pushed the phone into her pocket. I'll go grab my jacket and weapon. Kane hurried from the house. What's happened? Wolf came into the room loaded up with dirty plates. Jenna explained. We'll head out now. Sorry to ruin the cookout. 
We all had a relaxing afternoon. It was great. Wolf smiled at her. Don't worry about anything. I'll explain what's happened to the others. I get these in the dishwasher. I'll be sure to set the alarm before we leave. Relieved, Jenna smiled at him. Thanks, Jane. I'd appreciate it. I'll tend the horses to save you time when you get home. Rowley appeared at the kitchen door, carrying plates of food. Sandy will store the leftovers in the refrigerator. Grateful for such wonderful friends, Jenna squeezed his arm. Thanks, Jake. She rushed to her room to collect her duty belt and sheriff's department jacket. Giving her friends a wave, she hurried out the door as Kane drove up in his black, unmarked truck, affectionately known as the Beast. Climbing inside, she fastened her seatbelt and entered the address into the GPS. A thought came to her. Just how many glasses of wine have you had, Dave? One. Kane gave her a long stare. Have you ever known me to drink more than two glasses of wine? Like, ever? Jenna shook her head as they headed out the gate and hit the blacktop. No, can't say that I have. Why is that? Living in Black Rock Falls is a delight as well as a curse. Kane flicked her a glance. I'm never sure what's going to happen in any given hour, and I like to be clear-headed and ready for anything. Chapter Two Still damp after a late storm the previous night, the lowlands and mountain vistas surrounding Jenna's ranch appeared to have received a new coat of paint. Dressed in an artist's palette of fall colors, they sparkled under the late afternoon sun and gave off a fresh aroma. It had been good to see rain, after a dry spell had muted the lush green landscape. Although the storm had been loud, she had discovered, apart from the fear of the vet and baths, Duke, Kane's bloodhound, had added loud storms to his repertoire of fear. Her enjoyable Saturday evening with Kane, watching movies, had been disturbed by howls loud enough to wake the dead. The noise had sent her black cat, Pumpkin, climbing the drapes and hissing like a leaky furnace. When Kane, finding it amusing, had howled along with his dog, it had taken her forever to untangle Pumpkin and calm her down. Such were the changes in personality happening to Dave Kane of late. After his wife had died in a car bombing, he'd withdrawn into himself. But as the years slipped by, he'd slowly come to terms with his loss. He was still the same lean, mean fighting machine, ex-Special Forces sniper who'd arrived in town some years ago. But somehow now he laughed more and seemed to be living his life to the full. It was as if a great weight had been lifted from his shoulders, and seeing him happy made her smile. They'd taken the first tentative steps toward a relationship, but the decision to keep it strictly private had been unanimous. Being sheriff had responsibilities, and if things didn't work out between them, they'd remain friends, and no one would be the wiser. They headed into the town of Black Rock Falls, Jenna's gaze moved over the crowd of people making repairs to the rain-soaked fall festival banners. As Kane slowed the beast to negotiate the people spilling onto Maine, Jenna waved back at the cheery greetings of the townsfolk, who'd voted for her to protect them for an extended five-year term. The festival ran from Tuesday through Saturday and was a much-anticipated tourist attraction. Apart from the popular whitewater rapids and hiking or riding in the forest, this year, the town was hosting the Chainsaw Wood Carving Championships at the showgrounds, an art competition in the town hall, and a farmer's market in the parklands. All this, along with the normal street vendors and performers who swarmed to the festivals throughout the year, left Jenna hoping the violent crime side of her profession would slip into obscurity. She glanced at Kane. I'll call the media as soon as we've spoken to Dr. Turner. I'm going to need people to man the hotline phones. Yeah. Maggie and Walters might be able to do the first shift. Kane looked over at her. We could have the calls diverted to our phones for the night shift and sort out better arrangements for the morning. 
Jenna considered asking their secretary, Magnolia Brewster, or Maggie, as everyone called her, and the semi-retired deputy Walters to do a Sunday shift and sighed. Yeah, Raleigh's had a few beers. He'll be okay for the morning. I'm glad Sandy can drive him home. Although the way she's expanding, she won't be able to fit behind the wheel for much longer. She is, what, only five months or so by now? She might be having twins, Kane shrugged. Although they went for an ultrasound last week, and Raleigh hasn't mentioned anything. Jenna smiled. Yes, Sandy is playing her cards close to the vest. Most new moms can't wait to show off the images. I guess they want to keep things private. Kane winked at her. Sometimes it's for the best. Oh, absolutely. Jenna scanned the GPS. Raven's Way lies parallel to Stanton. I call this the creepy part of town. I wouldn't go near those alleyways after dark. I wonder why there are no street lights on this stretch of Stanton. I guess the town council hasn't caught up with the growth of the town. Kane turned right and then instructed by the GPS, took the first left. There are streetlights here. It's a newer area. He pulled up outside a brick house with a white picket fence. This must be the place. Jenna led the way through the gate and along the driveway. She knocked on the door and it flew open straight away. She stared at the disheveled man, his eyes wild and with his comb over hair hanging over one ear. Dr. Turner? Yes, that's me. Turner scowled at her, obviously agitated. What took you so long? Ignoring the smell of alcohol on his breath, Jenna lowered her voice and used a calming tone. My ranch is out on the other side of town, and I had visitors. I left the moment you called. May we come inside and talk to you? I guess. Turner eyed Kane suspiciously. Jenna followed his gaze. She had to admit, dressed all in black, with his Stetson pulled down low over his eyes, and wearing his weapon on one hip like a gunslinger, Kane, at 6'5 and over 250 pounds of muscle, didn't resemble a law officer. Uh, this is Deputy Kane. Okay, come in, but you should be out looking for Lori. Turner walked down a short passageway and into a family room. Someone might have kidnapped her. Why would someone want to kidnap her? Has anyone contacted you? Kane pulled out a notebook and pen. No, no one has called. Turner's eyes flashed with anger. I'd tell you if they had. Is there any chance she just ran away? Have you had any arguments lately? Kane was pushing the man hard. Only the usual things. Turner sat on a sofa and held his head in his hands, staring at the floral carpet. She's only had her driver's license for a few months, and she drives way too fast. I should never have given her the Ford for her birthday. She could be lying in a ditch somewhere. The poor man was beside himself with worry, and Jenna exchanged a look and a shake of the head with Kane to make him back off a little. Do you have a photograph of Lori we could use? Yeah. Turner stood and took a framed picture of a girl standing beside an old red Ford pickup from the mantel. He looked at it for a beat and then handed it to Jenna. I took this on her birthday. Jenna took out her phone and used her camera to capture the image. Is this her vehicle? Was she driving last night? Yeah. Turner sighed. It's not a long drive to the school from here. He attempted to correct his hair, running his fingers through the oily strands. As there was no game on this week, the cheerleaders decided to practice. They use the school gym and usually finish around 8.30 or 9 at the latest. How come you didn't notice she hadn't come home? Kane lifted his head from his notes. She should have been here by at least 10. I fell asleep in front of the TV. Turner couldn't sit still and rocked back and forth. I've fallen asleep before, and she usually leaves me here. I'm bad-tempered when woken suddenly. I see. Kane dropped his gaze back to the notebook. 
Do you like a few drinks before bedtime? Yeah. I've taken to drinking more than I should since my wife left me. Turner avoided meeting Jenna's eyes. But I'm stone cold sober now. Okay, Jenna leaned forward. So what time did you notice she was missing? She frowned. It was a little after three when you called me. I figure she'd gone out before I came down for breakfast. Turner looked at her, his eyes red-rimmed. I called her to bring home milk, and she didn't pick up. I've been calling all day. Then I called her friends. What time was this? Kane sat, pen raised, looking at him. Around eleven? Turner picked up a cushion and held it to his chest, squeezing it. When I called her friends, no one had seen her since she left the school. One of the girls mentioned she sometimes hangs out at Aunt Betty's cafe, so I went there and asked the manager if she'd seen her. The nice woman took me to the back room to show me the CCTV footage, and there was no sign of Lori. It's as if she's vanished. It would be hard to hide a 1950 Red Ford pickup. Kane raised both eyebrows. Maybe she went to visit her mom? We don't know where she's living. Turner clasped his hands in front of him. I came home from work, and Jeanette was gone. No note. She cleaned out her bank account and vanished. That was six years ago. I obtained full custody of Lori. And since then, we haven't heard a word from her. You didn't report her as a missing person? Kane's gaze hardened. Aren't you worried about her safety? No, she's not missing. Turner became agitated. She told me if I didn't quit drinking, she'd leave me and never contact me again. She took her clothes, her car, and our money. He glared at Kane. I'd say she's just fine. Did you hit her? Kane's face showed no sign of emotion. Or your daughter? I don't remember much when I drink. Turner started to rock again. But she was always complaining I did this or that. I see. Kane gave him a long, considering stare. Is there anything you need to tell us about, Dr. Turner? You're a psychologist and still practicing. So I assume your wife never had you charged with abuse. She wouldn't dare. Dr. Turner gave a smug smile. The court ruled her as an unfit mother. And if anything happened to me, Lori would be placed in foster care. She wouldn't want that. Now would she? I guess we'll have to find her and ask her. Kane turned his attention to Jenna. Lori could have broken down along the highway. Maybe we should head out to the high school and retrace her steps. Yeah, Jenna nodded. Would you mind if we take a look at her room? Does she have a laptop? Okay, but her bed hasn't been slept in. Turner stood. She changed the linen yesterday, and it's in the wash. Her room is as neat as a pin. How convenient. Jenna frowned. So, the laptop, then. It gives us a better idea of who she's in contact with on social media. She forced her lips into a small, calming smile. You sit down and direct me to her room. Up the stairs, first on the left. Turner dropped onto the chair. Take whatever you want. Jenna stood. Thank you. I'll need permission from you in writing to check her phone records as well. Deputy Kane will give you some paperwork to sign. I'll need you to complete a missing persons report and sign a brief statement about your circumstances, including the fact you don't have contact with your wife or know her whereabouts. Is this all necessary, Sheriff? Jenna wanted to roll her eyes at his lack of cooperation. What information you give us now means we can concentrate on finding Lori rather than chasing down people who are no longer involved in her life. Oh, very well. Dr. Turner's nostrils flared with a snort of anger. Give me the paperwork. She headed up the stairs and found the room. It was spotless. She checked through the bedside drawers and found photographs of cheerleaders, with Lori front and center, but no journal. She slid the laptop into an evidence bag and was heading back down the stairs 
when she noticed the bolt on the inside of the door. Taking out her phone, she took a few images of the door and room before hurrying downstairs. As she walked into the family room, she tucked the laptop under one arm and turned to Dr. Turner. Before we go, I'll need the contact details of her ex-boyfriend. And does she have a best friend? If so, I'll need her details as well. She looked at the distraught man and handed him her card. If you hear from her, call me. I'll be contacting the media and putting out a bolo on the pickup. As soon as we have any news, I'll call you. Just sit tight, Dr. Turner. We'll do our very best to locate your daughter. They climbed into the beast, and Jenna looked at Kane. This is going to go two ways. If we can't find the truck, I figure she's run away or heard from her mom and went to see her. If the truck shows up, then something has happened to her. Because from the look in her eyes in that picture, the truck means one hell of a lot to her. She wouldn't leave it behind. My gut tells me something's not right. Kane stared at the house. Jenna held out her phone toward him to show him the image of the bedroom. She has a heavy-duty bolt on her bedroom door. If he was violent, I'm not surprised. Kane snorted. I can't tolerate men who hit women. Jenna clicked in her seatbelt. What's your take on him? His mood changed from distraught to angry, like flipping a switch. And it's always a red flag when a person won't look you in the eyes, right? Yeah. And I'm seeing a ton of reasons why a kid would want to get out of a situation like that. Her father drinks and beats on his wife, and maybe her as well. Kane rubbed his chin thoughtfully. Giving a decked out hot rod to a 16 year old when he just admitted his wife cleaned him out seems a little overindulgent. He sighed. Most parents start out with a safe, but less expensive choice. It seems like a payoff to me. Nothing he said is sitting well with me right now. Concerned, Jenna turned in her seat toward him. I figure he might be involved. But if so, why call us and report her missing? It's not unusual for someone involved in a crime to try to insert himself into an investigation. It's all part of the thrill. They usually believe they have an ironclad alibi. He's already pulled the blackout card as an excuse for his behavior. Kane started the engine. Say he fell asleep in front of the TV at 10. He'd be sober in the morning, and it would be unlikely she wouldn't wake him on her way out. That pickup would be loud when it started. He turned onto Stanton and headed toward the high school. If he did do something to her last night, he's had all night to hide her body and make the necessary calls. Contacting us could just be part of his plan. Chapter 3 In normal circumstances, Jenna would have search and rescue out as soon as a missing persons report was filed, especially in the case of a 16-year-old. But something wasn't sitting right with her. Before they organized a search party, she had to confirm the girl was missing. Establishing a timeline and identifying the last person to see Lori was following procedure. They would need to know where to concentrate the search. Of course, once the media release hit the news, townsfolk would come forward, and with the help of the forest wardens and search and rescue, they'd be scouring the forest and surrounds in well-organized teams. Jenna contacted Maggie and Walters to take the hotline calls. With everything said, she could focus on the investigation. She leaned back in her seat and looked at Kane. I'll hold off with a search until we check with the boyfriend and best friend. If things weren't so good at home, Lori's friends might be covering for her. We should split the questioning. The girlfriend is more likely to confide in me and the boyfriend in you. Maybe. Kane drove into the high school parking lot. Well, look what we have here. Jenna couldn't miss the fire engine red hot rod pickup, sparkling as if it had just emerged from the car wash. Oh, it's going to be a shame to dust that for prints. She peered inside as Kane pulled up beside it, then slid out and took a better look. Empty. How do you get into this thing? 
There's no lock on this side. They open on the passenger side. Why is it here? Kane climbed out his truck and walked to her side, snapping on surgical gloves. The doors are locked, and she must have the keys. So what happened to prevent her driving at home? He went to the hood and pushed his fingers inside the grill. Ah, got it. The hood popped, and he lifted it and peered inside. Sabotaged. He pointed into the engine. Someone pulled off the battery cable. Jenna walked around the pickup. So she'd slide out the passenger side and then lock the door? Yeah. Kane smiled at her. Way back then, having to unlock your door with the traffic flying past was a safety issue. So they slid across the bench seat and out the passenger side. The roads were narrower those days as well. Something crunched under Jenna's boots, and she bent down. There are pieces of a phone down here, and the battery is by the back tire. I'd say she dropped her phone, and it smashed. She straightened and walked back and forth. Nothing else. She must have taken the case with her. Not something she'd do if she was in trouble. Kane stood, hands on hips, staring at the pickup. So we can assume she got a ride with a friend, or walked. It's only a mile or so from here to her home. He headed back to the beast and collected a forensics kit. I'll dust for prints. Jenna watched, not really surprised when the vehicle came up clean. Hmm, that's not good. The car was disabled and wiped clean. She frowned. So, she was set up. We need to know who delayed her so she couldn't get help from one of the other cheerleaders. This isn't looking good, Jenna. Kane removed his gloves. There could be any number of girls and boys in a cheerleading squad. And then you can add parents, friends, family members. This is getting out of hand already. He looked out over the parking lot. She's been missing for hours. If she'd smashed her phone, it would be normal for her to go home or failing that to a friend's house to stay overnight, as none of her friends have seen her, and we don't know if she's in contact with her mom. We have to assume she's in trouble. Jenna thought for a few seconds. Okay. We go see the girlfriend and find out what she knows. She'll be able to tell us the name of the captain of the cheerleading squad. Next, we go see her and ask her to contact everyone who she can remember was at practice and ask them to return to the gym at six. She pulled out her phone. I'll contact the principal and ask him to open up the hall. She made the call as she walked back to the beast. That sounds like a plan. Kane jumped behind the wheel and added the coordinates into the GPS. The girlfriend lives five minutes from here. Vicky Perez lived in a very picturesque wooden ranch house at the end of a long driveway on Pine. Jenna inhaled the scent of flowers and admired the overflowing garden beds on each side of the porch. The neat, well-cared-for home was nestled among pine trees and seemed to blend in with its surroundings. She went alone to the front door and knocked. When a middle-aged woman opened the door and stared at her with one hand over her mouth, Jenna moved quickly to reassure her. Mrs. Paris? There's nothing for you to worry about. I've come to speak to Vicky about Lori Turner. Bob called this morning, looking for Lori. Has something happened to her? Mrs. Perez waved Jenna inside. Come in, I'll get Vicky for you. Jenna followed her into a clean kitchen. We're trying to locate Lori. She didn't go home last night. Oh, that's not good. Mrs. Perez went out and stood at the bottom of the stairs. Vicky, come down to the kitchen now. The sheriff wants to speak to you about Lori. A girl appeared at once and came down the stairs at speed. She was dark-haired and exceptionally beautiful. Jenna smiled at her. Do you recall what happened last night after practice? Yeah. We collected our stuff and left as usual. Vicky frowned. I went over this before with Lori's dad. You do know he's the school counselor, don't you? He grilled me like I'd done something wrong. 
taken aback. Jenna blinked. Really? He didn't mention anything to me at all. Can you just think back to when you last saw Lori? What she was wearing, who she was with, and what she was doing? We wear our old uniforms for practice. A whole bunch of us walked out to the parking lot, and she went to her pickup. Vicky twirled a strand of her hair around her fingers. There was this almighty clap of thunder, and someone bumped into her, and she dropped her phone. It smashed. Wanting to know who had delayed Lori, Jenna raised both eyebrows in question. Who bumped into her? I didn't see. There was a crowd of us all walking together. One of the girls, I think, but I'm not sure. Lori was really upset her dad would find out, and then Becky suggested she take it to Corey. He's the maintenance guy and cleans the gym after practice. He's really good at fixing things, especially phones. So she went off to speak to him. Becky went to chase after Wyatt Cooper, and then we all went home. Jenna took out her notebook and pen and took down the names. So what's Becky's last name and Corey's, too? Becky Powell and Corey Hughes. Vicky's eyebrows met in a frown again. Becky shouldn't be chasing after Lori's boyfriend. They only just had a fight. I don't think it's over. He was there watching her at practice, like always. She sighed. Although everyone knows she likes Corey. She's always drooling over him. Ignoring the statement, Jenna nodded. Did you see her talking at length with anyone else at all that night? Yeah, a few people. Vicky thought for a few minutes. We went to the refreshments kiosk for a drink, and she chatted to Dale. He was working behind the counter. He's on the football team, but his aunt owns the kiosk and opens it for us during practice. Marlene was there, too. Marlene Moore. She's on the cheerleading squad. She is always hanging around Dale. He's the quarterback, so everyone wants to be his date at the prom. Jenna was having a hard time keeping up with the teenager's personal life. Including Lori? Including everyone. Vicky grinned. But he plays it real cool. I see. Jenna wanted to roll her eyes. Can you tell me the name of the captain of the cheerleading squad? I am. Vicky smiled. Jenna heaved a sigh of relief. At least this part of the investigation was easy. I'll need you to call the squad and everyone you can remember was at practice last night. Tell them the sheriff wants them at the gym at six tonight. Lori is missing and we need to find out her movements. We found her pickup in the school parking lot, so she must have taken a ride with someone. She wouldn't take a ride with someone she didn't know. Vicky lifted her chin. She's smart, not stupid. I've been calling everyone all day, and no one has seen her since last night. Are you sure her father hasn't locked her in the cellar? He threatens her all the time. He tells everyone he doesn't know where her mom is, but she's still working at the beauty parlor in town. He told her if she tries to take Lori away from him again, he'll kill her. Jenna stared at the girl. You heard him threaten her? No, but everyone says so. Vicky's brown eyes widened. What if he's killed Lori? Don't talk nonsense. He's a fine student counselor, and I've never heard a bad word against him. Mrs. Perez shook her finger at her daughter. You can't believe everything you hear. Jenna held up her hand to prevent an argument. Do you happen to know Mrs. Turner's phone number or where we can find her? Yes, I know her number by heart. We were at school together. Mrs. Perez rattled off the number. Jenna entered it into her phone. Has anyone called her? Not that I'm aware. Mrs. Perez frowned. It would be too far for Lori to walk alone at night. She lives in town. Jenna punched in the number. I'll call her now. She walked down the hallway and went outside. The phone rang several times before a woman answered. This is Sheriff Alton. Am I speaking with Jeanette Turner? Yes, this is she. Not wanting to alarm the woman, Jenna kept her questions general. 
Could you tell me when you last spoke to Lori? She called me last Thursday to chat about the fall festival. They're having a parade and she wants me to come by. Why? Is she in trouble? It's that damn pickup, isn't it? Has she had an accident? Taking a deep breath, Jenna kept her voice calm and professional. Not that I'm aware. I'm trying to locate her, is all. She didn't go home last night. She isn't in trouble with the law, Mrs. Turner. If she calls or drops by, could you let me know, please? Yes, I'll call her. She always answers my calls. Concern for Lori washed over Jenna. This wasn't the news she needed right now. Thank you. She disconnected and walked back into the house and made her way to the kitchen. Jeanette hasn't heard from her either. Okay. Vicky, pick up your phone and we'll split the list and get everyone back to the gym. Mrs. Perez grabbed the landline and looked at Jenna. We're used to calling everyone to make plans. I'll make sure they're all there. Relieved, Jenna smiled at her. I really appreciate your help. Thank you. She handed her a card. Here are my contact details. Call me if you hear anything. Anything at all. No matter how insignificant. Okay. Mrs. Paris pulled out a notebook from a kitchen drawer. Come on, Vicky. Start dialing. Jenna headed for the door. I'll see myself out. She moved swiftly along the hallway and outside to Kane's truck. After explaining, she leaned back in her seat. The boyfriend may still be in the picture. We'll go see him next. And I'll get out a media release and see if anyone has seen Lori. It would be unusual for a girl of her age with so many friends on foot not to contact someone. I mean, she could have dropped by here and called her mom. They are obviously on good terms. Even if she didn't want to go home, one of the friends from her inner circle would have seen her. Kane turned the truck around and headed back to Stanton. I guess we should speak to the boyfriend, but I have a very bad feeling about this, Jenna. If she was attacked on the street, the chances of finding her alive are slim. I figure we conduct a search along Stanton. Like you said, no streetlights. Anyone could have dragged her into the forest, and no one would have heard or seen a thing. Chapter 4 You'll never amount to anything. His ma's voice shattered his thoughts. You're a waste of my time. The sooner you leave school and go work with your pa, the better. I'll be glad to see the back of you. I'm sorry I don't earn more, Ma. He looked at her curled lip. I'm doing the best I can. Dad doesn't have a position for me yet. When he does, I'll move out. And leave me here with nothing to live on? His ma shook her finger at him. You're just like him. He don't care if I live or die. He couldn't win. Nothing he said pleased her. I'll still look after you, Ma but right now I have to go do something before dark. He turned to leave. That's right, leave me alone again. She moved toward him, fists clenched. If you were still little, I'd lock you in the closet to teach you some respect. He backed away from her, remembering the terror of the dark, smelly hole in the wall. He'd learned enough respect to last a lifetime. I do respect you, Ma. I'll be back soon, and we'll watch TV. Liar! You're going to see her again, aren't you? She spat at him. You're just like your father. A no-good, useless SOB. It was pointless arguing with her. When she looked at him, she saw a replica of the man who cheated on her and set up house with a bottle blonde. He headed for the door. He hated living here. The day his pa had walked out, he'd made it clear he had no room for him in his new life, but he'd promised him a position in his business, even though he'd be expected to start at the bottom and work his way up. Of late, he'd started helping his pa, driving over on Sundays to do yard work and dropping by each morning at his business to show his enthusiasm. He had to get away. 
Anything would be better than living with his ma. He walked through the trees and along a track that led to the old barn and smiled at the sight of a friendly face. She was his everything. And they had plans to move in together. But first, they needed to find a place for Lori Turner. He walked to her, and they kissed. I've been looking forward to coming here all day. Yeah, me too. She linked her arm through his. It was fun last night. I want to do it again. They strolled together to the old barn, and he pulled out a key for the padlock. Me too. It had been a rush watching her strangle Lori and bringing the girl here to their secret place. Sitting her up to watch them make out had stirred something feral inside him. It was like a hunger he couldn't satisfy, and he wanted more. We'll take her out and dump her. I know a ton of places to hide her. The smell of death greeted him as he opened the barn door wide. Propped up against the wall, Lori's expressionless eyes stared at them in the gloom. Her skin was blue, and her legs stuck out from beneath her. The flesh bruised, as if she'd been sitting in blood. Beside him, he felt a tremble go through his girl. She don't look so pretty now, huh? Seeing her here in our special place makes me mad. His girlfriend scowled at him. She'll stink up the trunk. He shook his head. No, she won't. Remember last summer I painted the kitchen for Ma? I took a box of plastic sheets from outside the general store. I have tons more stashed in here. We'll wrap her up and dump her. Look what I have. She grinned and opened her purse to reveal a pile of surgical gloves. We'll take everything, her clothes and shoes, and when we're done dumping her, we'll burn them and the plastic sheet. We don't want anyone tracing her back to us because I'm not done yet. She walked into the barn and stared at Lori's body. I'm not done with her either. Look at the way she's looking at me. She thinks she's all that. She turned and a determined look crossed her face. I want to do a whole set of them. We'll go down in history as the cheerleader killers. She snorted with a sudden burst of laughter, and then stopped and frowned. We'll need to be smart, because I'm not planning on going to jail. Don't worry your pretty head about that. He slid his arm around her shoulder and admired their first kill. We're way too smart for the cops to pin it on us. We'll dump her backpack in the forest, and they'll never look for her out at the mines. He squeezed her. There'll be nothing left of her here. I have the perfect place to burn everything. Chapter 5 Jenna and Kane drove slowly along Stanton, from the high school to the alleyway, in the direction Lori would have taken on foot. Jenna peered into the forest. She'd buzzed the windows wide open to pick up any smells. With Duke sitting in the back seat, any scent of death usually caused a reaction, and the bloodhound had sat motionless the entire time. We'll need a search party for this to work. If Lori was the victim of a thrill kill, it's unlikely the killer would have dragged her very deep into the forest. Kane flicked her a glance. He'd have attacked, made her walk into the forest, killed her, and then walked away. So if she's dead, I figure her body will be on the edge somewhere. Jenna pushed the hair from her eyes. Yeah, unless she got a ride with someone. She threw her hands into the air. Why is it that as soon as we have a festival in town, something happens? She stared at the blacktop. If someone's harmed this girl, we have a thousand tourists to consider as well. It will be like searching for a needle in a haystack. Let's hope she's just holed up at a friend's house, and we can go home and eat leftovers. Kane flashed her a smile. Or we'll have to be forced to stop by Aunt Betty's for supper before we head out to the meeting. As Rowley tended the horses and I have food in the truck for Duke, 
There's no reason to go home before the meeting. Jenna snorted. How come you always find an excuse to drop by Aunt Betty's cafe? No matter in the middle of a murder case or after an autopsy, it's the same. A man has to eat to keep up his strength. Kane chuckled. So we can go out hunting and fishing to feed our families. That's what stores are for? Jenna yawned. I often wonder how you'd survive without Aunt Betty's cafe. Oh, I'd survive. Kane accelerated along Stanton. Have you seen the size of the steaks at Antler's Tavern? As they drove to Wide Cooper's house, Jenna called Rowley to bring him up to speed and followed it with a quick call to Wolf. As a team, she liked to keep everyone in the loop. When the beast stopped beside a small cabin-style home, she checked the address and shrugged. This is the place. I hope Wyatt Cooper is at home. You take the lead, and I'll hang back. She slipped from the seat and headed up the garden path. He might talk to you man to man. The rank smell of burning came in a cloud of smoke from the backyard. I doubt it. Kane's nostrils flared. To him, I'm still a cop. Jenna knocked on the door, and a man in his fifties, wearing a plaid shirt and jeans, stared at them open-mouthed. Sheriff? Anything wrong? Is it about the smoke? Nah. Kane tipped his hat. Mr. Cooper, we'd like a word with Wyatt. Sure, sure, come in. Mr. Cooper turned and walked inside. He's out back, burning trash. I'll go get him. He headed through the house. Wait here. Jenna hung back as a lean, muscular young man of about 16 came walking into the hallway smelling of smoke. He ignored her completely and looked up at Kane. Where did you play football, man? Wyatt grinned at Kane. College is all. Kane smiled back and took a relaxed pose. Being non-threatening gave him an advantage. I figure you know why we're here. Jenna bit back a smile, a typical ploy to make a person believe they knew he was involved in something. She waited expectantly for Wyatt to speak. Nope, I have no idea why you or the sheriff are here. Wyatt looked at her. Ma'am? And why do you want to speak to me on a Sunday afternoon? I hear you broke up with Lori. Kane's voice lowered as he leaned conspiratorially toward him. Did you have a fight? Ah, I know what this is all about. Wyatt jerked his head back. Her father called asking me if I'd seen her last night. I told him, yeah, I'd seen her break her phone, but she'd hightailed it inside to speak to Corey before I could say anything. I told her dad just that, and he hung up on me. So you knew she was upset and didn't even wait for her in the parking lot? Kane kept his voice at the same level. With everyone gone, didn't you worry about her out there all alone at night? Look, man, she's been hanging around Corey since he started working at the school. Wyatt sighed. He's a loser, smokes dope, and is way too old for her. I made a stand, you know, him or me. She just ignored me and walked away. So why would I hang out waiting for her in the parking lot? I went to Aunt Betty's, grabbed a burger, and came home. What time was that? Kane had adopted his bored expression. He was here at 10. Mr. Cooper poked his head out of a door. My wife had gone to bed and I waited up for him. We watched the news together. Why do you need to know? Lori didn't make it home last night. Kane straightened. Any idea where she might be? Nope. Her dad didn't mention anything about her not getting home. Wyatt dragged a hand through his hair and stared into space. He should have called last night, and me and the boys would have gone out looking for her. Her truck is hard to miss. Her truck is still in the parking lot. Kane was regarding him closely. Holy shit! Wyatt moved around restlessly, eyes darting in every direction. Have you called Vicky? She isn't that far away, and Lori would walk there if she'd had car trouble. Yeah, we've spoken to Vicky. Kane folded his arms across his chest. What makes you think she had car trouble? Well, it makes sense. 
If her precious pickup is in the parking lot, then she must have walked home. She couldn't call anyone for help, could she? Wyatt shrugged. I doubt she'd wait back for Corey to finish work and get a ride with him, either. His sister hates her, and there'd be hell to pay if she discovered Corey gave Lori a ride. His sister? Kane took out his notebook and pen. No one mentioned he had a sister. Yeah, she's on the cheerleader squad. Her name is Verna, Verna Hughes. Wyatt rubbed the back of his neck. Corey has to clean up and lock the gym after the practice sessions, but his sister doesn't hang around. She grabs a ride or drives her ma's vehicle. Who else was there watching? Kane made notes. The usual crowd, some of the football team, Corey, of course, Stan Williams, the photographer guy, and Dale Collins was running the kiosk, as usual. Wyatt dashed a hand through his hair. Darn, I can't remember everyone. The phone in the house rang, and moments later, Mr. Cooper came into the hallway. Uh, excuse me, folks, but that was Vicky. She wants everyone who was in the gym last night to return at six. Mr. Cooper's eyebrows met in a frown. Something about Lori going missing. You're to call any friends you can remember being there? Sure thing, Dad. Wyatt looked back at Kane. I'd better go. You'll be at the gym tonight? Yeah. Kane folded his notebook and pushed it into his pocket. We'll see you there. Jenna turned and headed out the door. As they reached the beast, she peered at Kane over the hood. Do you think he's involved? Hard to tell. Kane opened the door and slid behind the wheel. Jenna climbed in, rubbed Duke's ears, and settled in her seat. He seemed a little jumpy to me. Yeah, well, he obviously still has feelings for Lori. And being interviewed by law enforcement is upsetting for most people. Kane started the engine. He did seem concerned for her well-being, which is a plus. But if we find her murdered, then all bets are off. Jenna pulled out her phone. I guess it's time for a media release. She seems to have vanished without a trace. Chapter 6 The news about Lori's disappearance hit the media. And although no calls came in about Lori's whereabouts, as usual, the townsfolk stepped up to join the search parties. For now, the local search and rescue had taken charge, until Jenna had the time to get her people organized. As daylight was fading, any treks into the forest would be postponed at nightfall and resumed at daybreak. Kane sat opposite Jenna in Aunt Betty's cafe as she organized a command center and called in deputies from surrounding counties to assist in a door-to-door -door search of the area, from the school to Lori's home. She worked with confidence, as unfortunately organizing searches had become a fact of life in Black Rock Falls. Being part of a forest had its advantages. They could always rely on the forest wardens for assistance. And of course, their close friend, Native American Atohi Blackhawk, had already called to offer his help. Kane glanced at his watch. They had an hour before they had to head to the meeting at the school gym, and he'd insisted on eating before a long night of investigating ahead of them. He'd noticed how Jenna skipped meals during a crisis, something that seemed trivial, but with the pressure of work and long hours, grabbing a meal was as important as breathing. No one could concentrate or make important decisions without eating. This was why he appreciated Aunt Betty's Cafe. It served great food, was open from six in the morning to way past eleven at night, and was rarely without a stream of customers. But members of the sheriff's department could dash in for takeout or a meal and be served without delay. He took in Jenna's strained expression as she made the calls. His fingers itched to reach across the table, squeeze her hand, and take her worries away. He smiled when she placed her phone on the table. I don't have to ask if everything is organized. You have this. I'm just glad Weber is still a badge-holding deputy. He offered to man the command post this evening. Rowley will take over in the morning. We'll be directing the boots on the ground first thing until the new shift of deputies arrive. Jenna rubbed her temples. Corey Hughes is going to be opening the gym tonight. If he has Lori's phone, I want it. 
He might have been the last person to have seen her alive. Or have her holed up somewhere. Kane sipped his coffee. It was a great idea to get all the potential witnesses together in one place. It will save a ton of grunt work. We need more deputies. Jenna let out a long sigh. I'm always calling in assistance from Blackwater. It was lucky Weber was available. Kane leaned back in his chair. He usually goes fishing on Sundays. Colt Weber had interned for Wolf at the ME's office, but had recently become his forensics assistant. He was still on the payroll as a deputy and stood in for them in times of need. Kane nodded. Ah, the food is on its way. He scanned her face. Please eat something. I worry about you. The food arrived, and they thanked the server, and Kane caught Jenna giving him a puzzled look. What? Why are you coming over all protective again? Jenna nibbled on one of her fries. Part of me likes knowing you care, but then I worry it will become a problem when we're on the job. Like when you first arrived. She raised her gaze to him. Or next thing, you'll be calling me ma'am again. Trying hard not to react by grinning. Kane cut into the prime ribeye and sighed. I'll always have your back, Jenna. That won't ever change. He looked up at her. Would I take a bullet for you? You betcha. He chuckled. That's not being overprotective. That's just doing my job. Okay, you win. Jenna sighed wearily. Time is ticking by, let's eat. After finishing their meal, Kane dropped a pile of bills on the table and then followed Jenna from the cafe. They would be at the gym early, and it would give them time to get organized. They'd stopped by the office and collected a ton of business cards to hand out and had copies of Lori's image to show around. When they arrived at the school, the parking lot was surprisingly full, and he parked outside the front of the gym. It looks like we have a big turnout. I guess they watched the news. Yeah, Jenna gathered her things. I hope someone has information, or this is a complete waste of time. She glanced around. She could be out there somewhere alone and hurt. Kane turned to her. You've had people searching for her from the moment we confirmed she was missing. There's not much more we could have done. It would have helped if her father had notified us early this morning, rather than waiting until three before calling. You know as well as I do, if someone has abducted her, the chances of finding her alive after so long are slim. It's close to 24 hours now since anyone has seen her. Yeah. Every hour that goes by makes it less likely we'll find her alive. Jenna climbed out and collected a pile of notebooks from the back seat. Although at 16, she could be holed up somewhere, so there's still hope. Kane slid out from behind the wheel and unclipped Duke's harness. He made sure he always secured his dog in his vehicle. It often drove at speed, and in an accident, if a dog weighing 100 pounds went flying through a windshield, it could be lethal for both his loved pet and anyone unfortunate enough to collide with him. Clipping Duke's harness into the seat restraint took no time at all. He hated seeing dogs standing unrestrained in the back of pickups, as if their owners had no care about their pets, or others using the highways. He rubbed the dog's ears. I know it's been a long day, but we'll be heading home soon. At least he can sleep when he wants to. We're not so lucky. Jenna handed him a pile of handouts. We'll need to get the names of everyone here tonight. Sure. Kane took the papers, and they headed inside. The brightly lit hall was filled with people all sitting on lines of plastic chairs, as if waiting for a town meeting. The place had the usual school gym smell, slightly sour, with a touch of eau de old socks and books. He had expected a crowd milling around, but to his surprise, Emily greeted him at the door, and Shane Wolf and his daughter Julie were close by. Hi, Emily. Did you organize all this? Me? <laughs> Emily chuckled. I helped, but it was Dad's idea. He even convinced them to open the kiosk for refreshments when you finished talking to them. 
As soon as people started arriving, he had them pulling out chairs from the storeroom and setting them out in lines. Julie helped me take down the details of everyone coming through the door. We thought it would save time. She handed Jenna two notebooks. I'll wait by the door in case anyone else comes by. I can't thank you enough. Jenna gave her a hug. The place is crowded. Surely not everyone here is from the cheerleader practice. I'm afraid not, Emily indicated to a news crew. They did a live broadcast from outside the hall and showed Lori's red pickup. After that, tons of people arrived. We've divided the ones who are here to the right of the hall, the sightseers to the left. She shrugged. That was Julie's idea, so you could ask questions directly to them. Kane looked at Jenna and raised one eyebrow. So, if everyone's here, who is out searching? I have it under control. Search and rescue have over 100 volunteers out looking for her. Jenna straightened. This is where we'll find the answer to what happened to her and be able to focus the search in the right direction. She glanced at him. I hate standing up in front of a crowd. It's worse than during my last election. She headed toward the podium. Kane fell into step beside her. These are your people. They're waiting for instructions. You'll be fine. Chapter 7 After wrapping Lori Turner in plastic, they'd heaved her into the back seat and covered her with a blanket. She'd been heavier than he'd expected, and sweat beaded on his brow and trickled down his back from the exertion. His girl had fashioned aprons from the plastic sheets, and they'd wrapped them around their bodies. He'd seen enough cop shows to know about leaving evidence behind. All sad, they'd driven through town far away from the search parties and headed out to the old mines. As long shadows crept in around them, he drove slowly to the place they'd chosen to dump Lori's body. The excitement he'd had when his girl had strangled her had ebbed. This part of the plan wasn't thrilling at all. We have to make it fast. Did you see the news? The sheriff expects everyone who was at the cheerleading practice to be at the gym by six. I know. You look bored. She curled a strand of hair around her finger, and one hand rested on his thigh. You figure once they're dead, they're no fun anymore? He pulled up beside an old mine entrance, and as he turned his vehicle around, the headlights picked up the cloud of dust they'd left in their wake. Kinda, he shrugged. Help me drag her out. She climbed out, looking strange in the blue surgical gloves with a plastic sheet wrapped around her jeans. An awful smell seeped out of the bundle as they dragged Lori to the mine entrance. Inside, the passageway to the shaft was dark and foreboding. A keep out sign blocked the way. They dropped her on the ground and pulled at the plastic to unwrap her spilling her naked body onto the barren soil. He swallowed hard. Lori looked up at him with a blank expression, deathly white. Blue had replaced her once pink lips, and her healthy glow had turned into a mask. He needed to get away. Look at her. She's still staring at me. His girl aimed a kick at the body. Stop looking at me, Lori. You can't have him. He's mine. Hey. He tried to comfort her. She's dead. Let's go. Without warning, his girl pulled a screwdriver from her boot and threw herself on the body. He turned away, unable to look at her. Seeing her kill had been exciting, thrilling, but this made him sick to his stomach. What is wrong with me? Why isn't she bleeding? His girlfriend looked over her shoulder at him, breathing heavily. I want to see her bleed. He took her arm and eased her to her feet, unwrapped her fingers from the screwdriver, and tossed it down the mine shaft. She's dead. She can't bleed when her heart's not beating. Help me clean up here, and we'll head to the school before we're missed. We'll need to stop by the park and get washed up. After collecting the plastic, and wrapping their aprons and gloves into a big ball, they carried it to the trunk. He'd burn everything later. 
He drove the vehicle 50 yards from the body, and they ran back. They dragged dead branches over the ground to remove footprints and tire marks. By the time they reached their ride, his girl had calmed down some, but she still had a sour expression. As he drove back to town, he glanced at her. What's wrong? It felt good killing her, didn't it? You taught her a lesson. I don't feel anything. It wasn't good enough. The next one, I'm going to mess up real bad. She folded her arms across her chest. You know I love you, right? So maybe you can take her to a house I found in town. Like a date. And then, surprise, I'll be there waiting for her. I want her to know that I'm better than she is. And that you chose me over her. I want her alive and suffering. So the last thing she sees is me with you. Strangling Lori was too fast. It didn't last long enough. The wild look in her eyes and the way she talked aroused him. His heart raced. Excitement tingled through him. He wet his lips. Watching her kill Lori had turned his girl into a superhero. He worshipped her. She had said she loved him, and it made him feel wanted. Not even his ma had done that. If it made his girl happy, he would walk through fire to see her kill again. He slid one arm over her shoulder and pulled her closer. She smelled like Lori, slightly putrid. But the memory of her strangling her for him made him smile. Yeah, make her suffer. He rubbed his chin on her hair. They all deserve to suffer. Chapter 8 The hall fell silent as Jenna moved in front of the lectern. She noticed the media jump into action and suddenly felt exposed. Her life as DEA agent Avril Parker was long gone, but the vulnerability that even plastic surgery couldn't erase surfaced the moment she stood in front of a camera. Two things she couldn't change were her voice and her eyes, and the idea of being discovered hiding in plain sight in Black Rock Falls was never far from her mind. The cartel she'd messed with, even though all had been reported dead, had fingers that stretched out in all directions. It would be the same for Dave, although he was officially dead and had remained off the grid, his past life had come back to haunt him. It would seem, no matter how hard they tried to remain hidden, the threat was a constant, nagging ache. She glanced at him, standing straight beside her, her rock, and then cleared her throat. It's good to see everyone here. First, I need to know if anything unusual happened to Lori during practice. Did she argue with anyone? No hands went up. Okay. Next, I need to know who was with Lori Turner in the parking lot after practice. A show of hands shot up. Okay, I want you to stand against the wall. Deputy Kane will take statements from you, but before you go, did any of you return to the gym with her after she dropped her phone? She waited, but no one raised their hands. Okay. Did anyone speak to Lori when she returned to the hall? Yeah. A man wearing jeans and a faded T-shirt pushed to his feet. I spoke to her. A buzz of conversation went around the hall. Jenna nodded. The man had to be Corey Hughes the school maintenance man and cleaner who Vicky had mentioned earlier. Okay, I'll need to speak to you as soon as I've finished here. She looked back at the people in the hall. Was there anyone hanging around or touching Lori's pickup when you left the parking lot? Not one person put up their hand, but people had already started to stare suspiciously at Hughes. Jenna waited for people to stop talking and looked over the crowd. People were still filtering in the door, and Emily was taking names. Okay, did anyone see Lori between 9 and 9.30 last night? I did. 
an elderly woman wearing spectacles gave Jenna a wave. Jenna smiled at her to encourage her. Will you come and speak to me, please? She looked around the room. Anyone else? See or hear anything unusual in the vicinity of Stanton Road between the school and Ravens Hill? No one stepped forward. Disappointed, Jenna heaved a sigh. Okay. I'm looking for volunteers for search parties starting at daybreak and going through until we find her. Please report to the command center outside the sheriff's department. The search parties will need to be changed during the day, so we'll be starting at staggered times. Six and twelve. Anyone willing to help with getting out supplies to the volunteers during the day? Coffee, water, sandwiches, and the like? It will be greatly appreciated. A group of young men waved at her, and she pointed to one of them. Yes? We have trail bikes and can help get supplies out to the search parties. He smiled. I'm Levi Jones. Who do I see? Come see me. Susie Hartwig from Aunt Betty's Cafe pushed to her feet. I'll see you get what you need. To Jenna's surprise, Mayor Petersham stepped out from the back of the hall. He nodded to Jenna. Evening, Sheriff. The town council will pick up the tab for supplies. Just send the bill to my office, Susie. At cost, then? Susie frowned. I'm not planning on making a profit over someone's misfortune. We all know how much Aunt Betty's Cafe contributes to the community. Mayor Petersham smiled broadly. Don't we, folks? After the applause had died down, Jenna nodded toward the kiosk. The kiosk is now open for refreshments. Thank you for coming. I'll see some of you at first light. As Jenna stepped down to speak to Corey Hughes, a skinny woman with a cameraman right behind her burst into Jenna's personal space and stuck a microphone in her face. Surprised, she took a step back and looked at her without saying a word. Denny Crawford, Blackwater News. Tell me, Sheriff Alton, how did you win another term as sheriff? Crawford leaned in, spewing bad breath like rotting fish. You don't seem to be coping with the crime in Black Rock Falls. It's like Murder Central over here. Wanting to cover her nose, Jenna moved back again, but the woman followed her, relentless and rude. She straightened. I'm not sure what you mean. We have a missing girl, not a murder. In fact, the last murder to occur in Black Rock Falls was almost a year ago. If I recall, three murders occurred over summer in Blackwater, not here. That's your town, not mine. My county covers many thousands of miles, and yes, we do have criminals using our vast forests to hide off the grid, but my goodness, how would you cope in the big city? Just a minute. She scrolled through her phone. As an example, 25 people were shot and 12 killed in one day in Chicago this week. Hmm, that makes Black Rock Falls kind of tame, don't you think? She held up her phone to show the news report. Ma'am? Kane came to her side. Uh, there's someone you need to talk to. Jenna nodded, glad to get away. She looked at the woman. I'll be happy to give out media updates on the search for Lori Turner, but I don't have time to discuss statistics with you. Okay, guys, cut. Crawford looked at Kane. How come you're always there to rescue the sheriff? Don't you believe she is capable of doing her job? She gave him a smile, wafting her bad breath all over Jenna. Or is there a little romance going on between you and you're being overprotective? You live on the same ranch. How about a little inside story on what happens behind the scenes when you're off duty? She touched his arm. It would make a great weekend supplement, all glossy color pages. The woman in yellow over there, Sheriff? Kane ignored Crawford completely and pointed to the back of the hall. I'll get back to the others. He turned his back and walked away. Jenna nodded. I'll be right there as soon as I've spoken to a witness. She moved her attention reluctantly back to Crawford. You said you wanted a scoop. I have one for you. Great, go ahead. Crawford pulled out her notebook. Jenna wrinkled her nose. There's a special on mouthwash at the general store. She walked away, heading in the direction of Corey Hughes. Hey, Kane caught up with her. What was that all about? I have no idea. Jenna shrugged. Someone with delusions of grandeur, I guess. 
She's right off the mark if she believes our private life is a hot topic of conversation. Townsfolk have better things to do with their time. I'm not sure I liked her inferring you can't do your job without me, Kane frowned. For a reporter, she is very uninformed. Jenna stared at him. Trust me, I don't care what she thinks. We have enough egocentric people to deal with. Forget about it and keep your mind on the case. Sure. Kane's mouth twitched into a smile. Just give me a wave if you need protecting. He walked away. Taking Corey Hughes into a quiet corner, Jenna pulled out her notebook and pen. He was tall and lean, about 20, with collar-length hair that hung over one eye. Thank you for coming forward. Can you tell me about seeing Lori in here after the practice session? Sure. Hughes leaned against the wall. I was sweeping up, and she came running in the door in a real panic. She dropped her phone. It was in pieces. The screen smashed, and the battery missing. She asked me to fix it. Jenna nodded. Did you? Nah, it was too far gone, and I told her. Hughes scratched his cheek. She was close to tears, said her pa would be angry. I told her I'd go see if any unclaimed phones had turned up and lost and found. Maybe she could use her SIM card in one of them. Hopeful he still had the remains of the phone, she continued making notes. And where is the phone now? In my office. Well, if you could call the closet where I keep my stuff in office. He gave her a slow smile. I haven't had time to check the lost and found as yet. Great, Jenna smiled. Can you get it for me? I have someone who can repair it if necessary, and I found the battery. Sure, Hughes straightened. I'll go get it. Before you go, Jenna moved in front of him. Then what happened? She regarded him closely, waiting for any change in body language. Nothing. I put the bits of phone into a plastic bag and stuck it on a shelf in my office. He shrugged. I locked the front door behind her and went home. Did you see her truck in the parking lot? Jenna folded her notebook and placed it into her pocket, and then pulled out a card and handed it to him. Nope. He stared at the card, turning it over in his hand. I turn out the lights before I leave, and my truck is out back. I drove straight past and onto the road. I didn't look to see if anyone was hanging around. All I wanted to do was get out of there. Jenna chewed on her pen. So she would have had to walk back to her truck in the dark. It's not that far, and she had time to get there before I closed up. Hughes shrugged. It was getting late, and when I turn out the lights, it makes the kids hurry on home. I'm not their nursemaid, and they're not babies. Slightly uneasy, Jenna frowned. Did you see another vehicle on the road? Yeah, I passed an 18-wheeler heading out of town, but nothing else until I drove down Maine. He shook his head. I don't really take much notice of the vehicles I drive past, unless they do something stupid. Do you live with anyone? Jenna lifted her chin. Anyone who can verify what time you arrived home? I live with my ma and my sister. My pa walked out on us recently. He frowned. But by ten, ma was in bed, and Verna didn't come home until later. You'll just have to take my word for it, Sheriff. Jenna nodded. Okay, thanks. Go grab the phone, and if you think of anything else or hear anyone mentioning Lori, please call me. Sure. Hughes walked into the crowd. Ahem. The sound came from behind Jenna. She turned to see an elderly woman in a yellow dress peering at her over her spectacles. Ah, sorry to keep you waiting. You saw Lori last night. Yes, I did, indeed. The woman fiddled with her purse. She was wearing her cheerleader outfit and carrying a backpack. Imagine a young woman walking out in the middle of the night dressed like that. Then I see a vehicle slow down beside her, just like you see the men chasing after streetwalkers on TV shows. She jumped straight in, and the car drove away in the other direction towards Stanton. Now I know Lori lives out of Raven's Way. I can't figure why she'd climb into a car when she was so close to home. Heart pounding, Jenna took out her notebook again. 
Your name, ma'am, and address? Mrs. York. She rattled off her details. A breakthrough and so early in the case would be incredible. Jenna needed all the details. She waved Kane over, as he seemed to be able to identify every vehicle on the planet. What time was this, do you recall? Close to 9.30. Mrs. York nodded as if to herself. There was a storm coming, so I gave my dog a run in the yard and was heading back inside when she came running out of the alleyway. Holding up a hand, Jenna stared at her. Running? Was someone chasing her? Not that I could see. I was looking through tree branches, but I know it was Lori. Mrs. York turned her attention to Kane and then moved it back to Jenna. She moved under the streetlight, looked behind her, and then hurried along the sidewalk. Next minute, headlights came round the corner and the vehicle stopped. She jumped in. They drove off, and I went back inside. It was none of my business what she was doing. Jenna pushed on. Did you see who was driving or notice anyone else in the vehicle? No, I'm afraid not. Mrs. York screwed up her eyes. No, just a dark shape is all I remember. You see, Lori was bending over looking in the window. She obscured my view. This is Deputy Kane, Jenna indicated to Kane. Can you describe the vehicle to him for me, please? I can. It wasn't one of those trucks the young people usually drive. It was a Chrysler sedan, maybe green or gray. Mrs. York smiled up at Kane. I know it was a Chrysler because we have one and it was similar. I'll find some images. Kane pulled out his phone. We'll see if one of them looks familiar. Jenna returned to the lectern. Could I have your attention, please? She waited for the buzz of conversation to die down. Does anyone here know anyone who drives a Chrysler sedan, green or gray? The silence was deafening. Okay, there is a stack of my cards on the table beside the entrance. Please take one, and if you see anyone driving a similar vehicle, take down the plate number and call the hotline on my card. Thank you. Jenna scanned the hall. Hughes was heading her way carrying a plastic bag. She stepped down from the lectern and went to Kane's side. Excuse me, Dave, did you get the statements from the people who spoke to Lori in the parking lot? Wolf took over so I could rescue you from the reporters. Kane gave her a lopsided smile. He's almost through by the look of things. Okay. Jenna handed Mrs. York her card. I'll leave you with Deputy Kane. If you think of anything else, call me. Anything at all. She glanced at Kane. Finish up here. I'll talk to Hughes again and do the rounds of the hall. We'll drop by the command center and then we'll head home. We have an early start in the morning. Chapter 9 Monday Mist still curled through the lowlands when Jenna and Kane arrived at the control center at daybreak. The fall morning had a crispness in the air with the distinct, tangy, earthy smell that came from dead leaves. In the distance, the snow-capped mountains dominated the landscape. It had been a cold night, and if Lori was out there alone and injured, her chances of survival would be minimal. The search parties had insisted on going long into the night, before it became too dangerous to be moving around the forest. As they rounded the building, Jenna stared at the crowd. People had gathered at the back of the sheriff's department and spilled onto the sidewalk. She recognized some of the deputies from Luan and Blackwater, but not the man standing beside Rowley. She eased her way through the crowd toward him. It seemed Rowley had completed the organization at some ungodly hour, and groups were leaving with forest wardens and deputies all carrying maps. Morning! Rowley nodded in her direction and handed a deputy a pile of maps. No sightings of Lori at all, overnight, but we're doing a grid search of the forest two miles alongside Stanton. Atohi will be back by noon. He worked until late into the night with his team, checking all the trails wide enough to drive a vehicle. I'll move the command center to the front desk. Now everyone is organized. So you have everything under control? 
Jenna smiled at him. Yes, ma'am. Rowley collected his things. Maggie will be in at nine, and same with Walters to give me a break, so I can go have breakfast. I can watch the desk. Emily Wolf was leaning against her silver Colorado and straightened to come toward them. I don't have classes today. You go eat. Thanks. Rowley looked tired. I won't take long. Jenna frowned. Take your time. You look exhausted. We'll manage just fine. She took in the young men beside him. Dressed in a Black Rock Falls deputy uniform, he could only be Zach Rio. Tall, slim, and muscular, with dark curly hair. And standing around 6'3", he had a friendly, intelligent expression. She offered him her hand. You must be Zach Rio. I'm Jenna Alton, and this is Dave Kane. His handshake was firm but brief. Welcome to Crime Central. Kane shook his hand. Oh, I don't think so. Rio shook his head. What's happened here in the last few years is a weekend's work elsewhere. This is a massive county. I'm not surprised people come here to disappear. Jenna liked him already. Come inside. We'll show you around. Thank you. Rio looked around. I arrived just in time, by the look of things. How do you manage with only two full-time deputies? We call in help from the other counties. Jenna took the steps. We currently have a teenage girl missing. I'll bring you up to speed. No need. Rio flicked her a glance. Wolf walked me through the case last night. He gave Duke's head a scratch. I know all about Duke as well. And Wolf gave me the rundown on every new forensics technique he's used over the last month or so. Yeah, he tends to do that, but loses me halfway through. Jenna grimaced. Although, Wolf never ceases to amaze me. He puts in the hours and is amazing at his profession. She led the way to the front of the building and walked inside. He and his girls helped out at the school gym last night. We'd all have been there until way past midnight without their help. They moved inside the office, and she sank into her chair behind the desk. Kane sat down, and Rio stood. Jenna smiled at him. Take a seat. You'll be working in the main office with Kane and Rowley. If necessary, we have a communications room we can use. My office will be getting upgraded in the next few weeks. As you can see by the work going on outside, we've had substantial additions made to the building. She thought for a beat. Then there's the house. It's fully furnished and has room for a housekeeper. It's owned by this office, so no rent to pay. I've replaced all the mattresses and linen. It's good to go. You can move in when you're ready. Yes. Wolf mentioned that as well. Rio smiled. I'm paid up until the end of next week, so we'll make the move then. I'll need time to pack. Good. Jenna leaned on the desk and clasped her hands. I'd like to know about your experience with missing persons and murder cases. I've handled many of both and solved all but one. Rio removed his Stetson and placed it on her desk. I'm very interested in criminal behavior, and because I was gifted or cursed with an incredible memory, I retain everything I read or see. My problem is I'm not a behavioral analyst. I appreciate Deputy Kane is a profiler, and Wolf informed me you have the ear of Joe Wells, the FBI's top behavioral analyst. I can provide you with case studies on the fly as comparisons, which would be of some help. He clasped his hands together. I'm studying Montana law, as between states, the differences are considerable, as I'm sure you both know. You're not from around these parts, are you? He shrugged. That's another annoying feature. I seem to be able to pinpoint accents with accuracy, although Kane here has me baffled. Do I? Kane gave Jenna a knowing look. I figured I'd started to blend in fine. You're a mixture, so I'd say you moved around as a kid. Rio snapped his fingers. Army brat? Yeah, we moved around some. Kane smiled. Have you lived in California all your life? Yeah, but this is our home now. Rio frowned. I lost my folks in a plane crash a year ago. 
I left my brother and sister with my step-grandma, and they didn't settle. It was a nightmare. They ran away, and it took me weeks to find them. He pushed a hand through his hair. Having 15-year-olds living with me in a one-bedroom apartment wasn't going to work, so we moved here. I took any job I could find and got the kids into school. They've settled down well, but I missed law enforcement. When Wolf hunted me down and told me about the available position here, I had to apply. Jenna nodded. It's not the same as having a detective's shield. We all work together according to our strengths. Yeah, Wolf explained. Rio glanced at Kane. A good leader plays to their strengths, and from what I see, nobody is complaining. Your application mentioned an interest in media. Kane stood and went to the counter and filled Jenna's coffee pot with water from the sink. Does this mean you'll be able to handle the dreaded press releases? Sure. Rio smiled. I can capture crime scenes and take any images you require as well. I have a trunk load of equipment at your disposal. Jenna grinned. Sweet. I figure we're all going to get along just fine. She stood, picked up her notebook, and grabbed the pen for the whiteboard. Now, I'll get down some notes on what we know about Lori Turner's disappearance. If you'll allow me to make things easier for you, Sheriff? Rio smiled. I could handle the whiteboard. I don't need notes. It's all in here. He tapped his head. Well, that would save me a ton of time. She handed him the whiteboard marker. Go right ahead. If and when necessary, I can distinguish behavioral patterns as well, so can give you an idea of where a killer might strike next. Rio cleared his throat. Well, in a place this size, an approximation, at least. Yeah. Kane collected cups and added the fixings to Jenna's desk. We discussed comfort zones with Joe during our last case. It's good to know you can recognize a pattern at the get-go. It will save time. Jenna leaned back in her chair and stared at them. Right now, we have a missing girl. So get your heads around the evidence to date. The vehicle is significant, and the woman who noticed Lori said she was carrying a backpack. Yeah. Could she have planned to run off with someone? A boyfriend, perhaps? Rio paused from adding notes to the whiteboard and opened his hands wide. Girls of Lori's age do it all the time. You have experience with cases involving 16-year-olds? Kane filled three cups and returned the pot to the heat and then sat down. Happens I do. Rio sat back down, ignored the fixings, and blew on the hot brew. My brother and sister are twins. They just turned 16. I don't remember life being so complicated at that age. It's as if they're at war with the world. He glanced at Jenna. They just took off, and I found them at a soup kitchen three days later. Did they have a problem with their grandma? Kane added cream and sugar to a cup and stirred slowly. Yeah, she has a tendency to run down my folks and believes everyone is useless. Rio sighed. That's water under the bridge now. They are happy at Black Rock Falls High School and have settled in well. I was expecting it to take longer, but I figure they appreciate the chance to start fresh. That's good to know. Jenna smiled as Kane pushed the cup toward her and then tended to his own. But this girl broke up with her boyfriend. We've spoken to him. And the other guy she apparently liked was Corey Hughes. Rio waved a hand at the board. He had her phone, but wasn't the last person to see her alive. Yeah, and he doesn't drive a Chrysler sedan. His ride is a GMC pickup. Kane thumbed through statements Wolf had taken the previous evening. He was very cooperative. Wolf has the phone, and he'll be able to check the phone records and we'll have a list of her contacts. Hmm. Rhea looked at Kane. So, someone unknown bumped into her. She dropped her phone, took it to Hughes, and when she came out, someone had tampered with her car. He narrowed his gaze. I know zip about engines. 
How long would it have taken someone to disable her truck? If the person knew how to lift the hood? No time at all. But how many people would know the technique? I only know because I worked on one as a boy. Kane looked thoughtful. Assuming people were still leaving when Lori returned to the gym, no one noticed anyone tampering with her pickup. Jenna's mind was working overtime, and she'd replayed the scene in her head repeatedly. I figure Lori's abduction was planned. She looked from one deputy to the other. The tampering happened during the training session. Her friend Vicky stated that someone in the crowd bumped into Lori and knocked the phone out of her hand. That could have been a setup. It was common knowledge she had the hots for Hughes. So who else would she go to for help? They all said he fixes everything, including phones. Yeah, that makes sense. Kane sipped his coffee. Jenna could see it as clear as day. Lori goes to speak to Hughes. He can't fix her phone, so she heads back to her pickup. During this time, Hughes leaves, so when Lori realizes her vehicle won't start, she's stuck. Hughes has gone, she has no phone, so she heads home on foot. Whoever picked her up must have followed her, and then driven up and offered her a ride home. She stood and added notes to the whiteboard. She knows the person driving the Chrysler and climbed in without fear. What we need to find out is what happened next. A knock came on her door. It was Emily. We have a body. Chapter 10 A sinking feeling dropped over Jenna, and she stared at Emily in disbelief. Female? Yeah. A lineman found her out at the old mine. She's naked and cut up some, from what the man said. Here are the coordinates. The guy's still on scene. His name is Al Watson. Emily's face showed no emotion as she passed Jenna a slip of paper. She had mastered the concealment an M.E. must have to cover their inner emotions. I'll call Dad. She turned in a toss of her long, blonde hair and vanished down the hallway. Is she the trainee medical examiner? Rio looked after Emily with obvious interest. She doesn't seem old enough. Well, like you, she's some years ahead of her time. Kane smiled. She still has years of study ahead of her. But with Wolf to guide her, she'll make a fine medical examiner. Kane swallowed his coffee and stood. I'll call Rowley and let him know we'll be locking the office. He strolled out the door with Duke on his heels. Jenna stood. Sure, thanks. She looked at Rio. Do you have your cameras with you? Yeah, they're always in my truck. Rio smiled at her. It's a hobby. Jenna nodded. Great, then follow us to the location. You'll be recording the scene. Sure, but what about Rowley? Rio looked genuinely concerned. He's my superior, and I don't want to be treading on anyone's toes. Astonished by his concern, Jenna met his gaze. I'm your superior. Kane is deputy sheriff, but we work as a team. I need Rowley here to hold the fort while we are recovering the body, and I'll need you to record the scene. She smiled. It's horses for courses, Zach, and that's how we roll around here. Okay. Rio finished his coffee and smoothed down his hair before pushing his Stetson on his head. I figure I'm going to enjoy working here. They headed out in a convoy, moving through town, trying hard not to attract too much attention. The last thing Jenna needed was the media destroying evidence at a crime scene. As the media's attention was on the search parties, by the time they left town and headed for the industrial lowlands that spread out between Black Rock Falls and Blackwater, they'd left the media vans far behind. The GPS led them along an old, uneven road. Mounds of dirt and rock, long covered by weeds, dotted the surrounding grasslands. Cabins long deserted had plants growing from the gutters and sat in general disarray. The exhausted gold mines had recently been sold to a mining company, who'd returned favorable assays and planned to reopen the lucrative industry. 
New mines meant prosperity for the town and work for a ton of people. A good source of energy was vital, and new electricity lines had been erected over the last six months. The white paint of a vehicle sparkled under the morning sun, and Jenna made out the lineman's truck parked beside one of the new electricity posts. That must be our guy. If he's working alone, it would have been a shock finding a body way out here. Kane pulled up beside the truck. I wonder what he was doing over by the mine shaft. It looks like it's some ways from here. After scanning the area, Jenna unclipped her seatbelt. I guess we're going to find out. Behind her, Rio slowed his vehicle and stopped. But like Wolf, he remained inside. Jenna smiled to herself. It was a sign of a good detective to wait and not enter the crime scene before invited. Once they approached the body, Wolf would take the lead. An Emmy's investigation took priority at the crime scene, and she valued his knowledge. She opened the door, and her boots hit the hard soil. By the time she rounded the hood, Kane had coaxed the man out of the cabin of his truck. She walked up to him. Al Watson? She made the introductions. Where did you find the body? Over there. Watson pointed to the right. I was making repairs to the connection and seen something, so I drove over to look. Jenna nodded. Did you get out the truck or touch anything? No, ma'am. Watson's face paled. I turned right around and hightailed it back here and called 911. You did the right thing. Relieved, Jenna glanced at Kane, and he went to speak to Wolf. She turned back to Watson. Did you see anyone hanging around or driving by this morning? Nope, not a soul. Watson ran both hands down his face. It was a shock seeing a young girl like that. Jenna understood the feeling. Will you be okay? I guess. Watson swallowed, and his Adam's apple bobbed up and down. He was sheer white. Is she the missing girl that's been all over the news? I have no idea at this time. Jenna had to keep him from informing the press. I must insist you tell no one about this until we establish who it is and notify next of kin. The press will be all over it, and it would be a terrible shock to the family if they hear about it on the news. Plus, crucial evidence could be destroyed if they come here and stamp all over the crime scene. Do you understand, Mr. Watson? Sure. Watson's gaze drifted over to Wolf's van. I'll call in sick and go home. I'm done here for now. That would be for the best. Jenna walked him to his truck. We have your details, and we'll contact you if we need any more information. She handed him her card. Call me if you think of anything else. I will. Thank you. Watson climbed into his truck and drove away. Jenna walked back to the beast and climbed inside. He spotted the body from up the pole and went to look. I was hoping we'd find Lori Turner alive, but after discovering someone disabled her truck, I wasn't optimistic. Kane drove to Wolf's van and parked in a patch of long, dry grass. As she picked her way with care around Wolf's van, she caught the smell of decay. She pulled out a couple of face masks and handed Kane one. From the smell, she's been dead since Saturday night. What have we got? Kane stood beside her on the perimeter of the scene as Wolf processed the body. Female, approximately the same height, age, and hair color as Lori Turner. But her face is too damaged to make a visual ID. Wolf peered at them over his face mask. I'll let Rio finish capturing the scene, and then Weber will take the stills before I examine the body but I know the killer inflicted the stab wounds post-mortem by the lack of blood loss. She wasn't killed here. The liver mortis, the bluish-purple discoloration under the skin of the legs and buttocks due to gravitation of blood after death, indicates she was in a sitting position for hours before being moved. A solid weight settled in Jenna's stomach at the sight of the body. The girl had welts around her neck and multiple stab wounds over her face and chest. It didn't take too much insight to see the rage behind the attack. Multiple stab wounds and to the face was very personal. Whoever did this 
hated this girl. She turned to look for Kane and found him checking all around the scene, walking back and forth. As he came back to her, phone in hand, she went to his side. Find something? Yeah, Kane indicated behind him. Someone sure went to the trouble of covering up any tracks. They swept the area. A prickle went down Jenna's spine. Show me. Someone dragged those dead bushes over there and pulled them over their tracks. The bushes are heavy, which means they're strong. So I'd say male with muscle bulk. He snapped on a clean pair of surgical gloves. I tried pulling them together, and it wasn't easy. Hmm, interesting. Rio came to her side. I've captured the scene. I've used a grid filter on the images so it's easier to identify evidence when we leave the scene. He frowned. That woman wasn't murdered here. Her body is clean. No defensive wounds that I can see. No blood. It's a dumping ground. But there are scuff marks beside the body. Something the unsub missed. It looks as if they kneeled beside the body to inflict the wounds. Small puncture wounds. Like an ice pick or similar. Unsub? Jenna looked at him. I heard Joe using that term. What does it mean? Unknown subject. Rio regarded her with a surprised expression. You've worked cases with the FBI. It's a term they commonly use now. I guess to soften the word killer because, in truth, that's who it usually refers to. It's common with law enforcement. Impressed, Jenna regarded her new deputy with interest. Have I been out of touch that long? Okay, go on. So if the girl wasn't killed here, there's a primary crime scene out there somewhere. Rio glanced at Kane. I noticed you checking the ground. It looks like the killer covered their tracks. Yeah, sure does. Kane regarded him closely. What else did you get from the attack? Hate. Rio's mouth turned down. They wanted to make sure the victim was dead, which makes me believe the unsub is known to the victim. I figure that fact is well established by Mrs. York's description of Lori getting into the Chrysler. Kane shook his head slowly. From her account, Lori appeared scared and was pleased to see the person in the vehicle. The too familiar feeling of dread crept over Jenna. She hugged her chest and stared at the body. This person is living among us. We must find the Chrysler sedan. Starting with the CCTV footage from town to see if it went by and when. From the high school to where they would have driven through town. Maybe. Kane rubbed his chin. If he's local, he'd know where the CCTV cameras are situated and take the back streets. He seems a mite too careful to risk being caught on film. Chapter 11 Wolf examined the area around the victim. Even without blood loss, such a violent attack produced bodily fluid spatter, and he kept everyone at a distance until he'd taken samples. The tin doorway to the shaft yielded a clear result, and he made sure Weber took shots of the pattern. From what he could see, it was a frenzied attack with attention made to the face and eyes of the victim. It happened post-mortem and might have been an afterthought to cover evidence, or the killer had an underlying mental problem. He would discuss his findings with Kane and even call in Joe Wells, the FBI behavioral analyst, to look at the victim. Did you see this? Kane indicated inside the roof of the mine entrance. That spatter from something being tossed and tumbling, throwing out a pinwheel pattern. He pulled out his mag light and scanned the sandy bottom of the entrance. No footprints or brush marks. He turned to Wolf and smiled. I figure he threw the murder weapon down the mine shaft. Wolf moved closer. You don't say. He examined the marks. I concur, but how far does this cave go before it drops into oblivion? The main shaft would be covered. Kane edged inside, keeping to the wall. 
It's for safety reasons, and they blocked them off when the place was sold. With luck, we'll find the weapon inside. Intrigued, Wolf followed close behind, searching the ground with the beam of his maglight. There is a fresh chip out of that beam. It must have ricocheted off and be close to you. Found it. Kane crouched and shone his light over a screwdriver. Do you want soil samples from in here as well? Wolf slipped the screwdriver into an evidence bag, labeled it, and waited for Kane. This is vital. I sure hope we find prints on it. He made his way back to the body. Add it to the chain of custody book for me, and there's a milk crate in the back of my van. Drop it in there with the soil samples. Sure. Kane took the evidence bags and strode out the mine. Wolf went back to the body to examine the wounds. He had little doubt they'd found the weapon. He leaned in closer and spotted something in the victim's mouth. He turned to Emily. She has something thrust inside her mouth. I'll open her jaw for you to pull out the object. He looked at Weber. Open an evidence bag. We don't want any contamination. He opened the jaw, and it moved easily. Rigor had come and gone. Now he made out a ball of fabric, and as Emily lifted it from the victim's mouth using tongs, he shook his head in disbelief. Get that bag sealed. He turned to Jenna. The victim has a pair of men's briefs in her mouth. This means something to the killer. It's significant. What do you think, Kane? Jenna turned and stared at him. I agree. Kane moved closer. This entire scene is weird. I'm not speculating until Wolf has her on the table. I see strangulation marks as well. Nothing makes sense here. Weird is right. Rio shook his head. I'd like to know what was going on inside the head of this killer. Wolf looked at Jenna. We'll need Dr. Turner's DNA for comparison, but mitochondrial DNA would be better. Can you contact her mother? When you speak to either of them, I would advise they not view the body and leave the identification up to me. Her mother works at the beauty salon in town. Jenna's expression was troubled. I really won't enjoy giving her the bad news. I know we can't confirm anything, but we all know this is Lori Turner. I've seen enough here. I'll go by the salon and see if we can find her mother. Will you be conducting the post this afternoon? Intrigued by what he was seeing before him, Wolf nodded. Yeah, there is so much here to process. I'll be starting on the preliminary examination as soon as we return to the morgue. He frowned. She's well into decomposition. I'll be able to get a TOD for you when I get her back to the lab. But I'd say from her temperature and state of rigor, she died around the time she climbed into the vehicle. So maybe strangulation? Jenna rubbed her temples. Exasperated, Wolf raised his eyebrows. You know darn well I can't give you a cause of death until I've completed the autopsy. It's obvious she received some type of restriction to her neck from the bruising. But from the lack of it as well, it appears to be what I'd usually see from a cord tightened from behind. Sorry, I shouldn't jump to conclusions. Jenna kicked a clump of grass and looked at Kane. It's just that she was in the vehicle and from what I'm seeing is bruising way up under the neck, as if someone was in the back seat and strangled her from behind. Yeah, Kane moved in closer. Or more likely attacked her from behind when she climbed out of the vehicle. Mrs. York has a pretty good recollection of the event. She doesn't mention Lori looking in the back seat, and people usually acknowledge another person in a vehicle. Why would the second person be in the back seat? It's a sedan. Most friends would ride shotgun. Wolf looked from one to the other. Until I determine the cause of death, this discussion is a waste of time. He nodded toward Rio. Are you coming to the autopsy as well? Sure, if I'm not needed elsewhere. Rio glanced at Jenna. Would you like me to relieve Rowley? You'll need to familiarize yourself with the running of the office before I let you do that. Jenna cleared her throat. The locals will be suspicious of you at first. With Rowley, when he gives them advice, they take it. Good to know. 
Rio moved away to speak to Emily, who was bagging the victim's hands. Wolf stood back and waited for Emily to finish and then turned to Jenna. I'm done here. We'll bag her up and get her into the morgue. Autopsy is at two, but I need the DNA samples from Mrs. Turner yesterday. I'm on it. Jenna nodded and looked at Rio. Head back to the office and get the images and footage uploaded. Rowley will give you the passwords and make sure Wolf has all the data first. We'll be back soon. At his nod, she turned to Kane. Let's go hunt down Mrs. Turner. Wolf stared after her. Jenna was wearing her detached facade again. It was just as well. Informing a mother her daughter might have been murdered was gut-wrenching. But worst of all was having to insist they refrain from viewing the body. Some would always insist. And then the image of their mutilated child remained with them forever. Chapter 12 Pushing down the emotion of seeing a brutally murdered young woman dumped like garbage, Jenna walked away, took a few deep breaths to clear her mind, and removed her face mask and gloves. She balled them up and shoved them into a paper bag Kane was holding out for her. As he rolled up the top of the bag and stowed it on the floor of the back seat of his truck, she looked at him closely. His eyelashes covered his expression, but she knew that his brain was working overtime. During her time at Quantico, she'd become close friends with a writer, and often he'd go quiet and stare into the distance, or just sit and do nothing. Kane did the same, and she often wondered what was going through his mind. Her friend told her it was a writer's trance, the time when the magic would happen and a story would drop into a creative mind. But with Kane, maybe he was weighing up the evidence. As he gave Duke a rub around the ears, she heard him whisper something to the dog that made him bark. The loud noise inside the cab of Kane's truck startled her. What's wrong with him? He's fine. Kane smiled at her. I just told him he'd be heading to Aunt Betty's cafe soon, and as it's Monday, Susie will have some leftovers from the Sunday special for him. She always puts something by for Duke. Jenna waited for him to slip behind the wheel. Susie is always so nice to everyone. I wonder why she isn't married. You'd think she'd meet everyone eligible in town working at Aunt Betty's. They do say a way to a man's heart and all that. Hmm. Kane rubbed his chin and thought for a beat and then gave her a wink. Nah, nice as she is, I wouldn't trade her bacon and eggs for your toast. He grinned. I think it's cute the way you try to cover up the burned bits with extra butter. Jenna chuckled. It was good to break the horror of the morning with a little light teasing. Aw, shucks, Dave, now I'm blushing. She fluttered her eyelashes and pressed one hand to her heart. That doesn't mean I expect you to cook me breakfast. Kane's smile flashed white. I'm happy to take my turn. You know that, right? Yeah, Dave, I do. Jenna sighed. I hate to break this mood, but we have a job to do, and a very unpleasant one. This will be the second time I've had to give bad news to someone in the beauty parlor. They'll be refusing me entry soon. I know what you mean. This part of the job stinks. Kane turned the beast around, and they headed for the highway. I'm hoping this is a one-off, but if this guy hits again, I figure we need to search for a killing ground, a barn, or perhaps a garage. Jenna stared at a vista of wheat grass. As the wind moved over it, creating ripples, the lowlands turned into a golden ocean, and she wished she was far away on a beach somewhere. She had to drag her mind away from the idea of splashing through waves and feeling sand between her bare toes and listen to him. She nodded. Yeah, the screwdriver was a strange weapon of choice. With so many people carrying hunting knives, it seems strange to bring a screwdriver out here. She blinked at Kane as an image flashed across her mind. I've often seen carpenters or handymen 
carrying screwdrivers in back pockets or hanging from a utility belt. She thought back. In fact, I'm sure I saw the handle of one poking out of the top pocket of Corey Hughes's work shirt. We'll check it out after the autopsy. Kane shrugged. Wolf might have found prints or trace evidence. I hope so, but Hughes doesn't drive a Chrysler sedan, so I guess he's off the list. Jenna leaned back, trying to compose the words in her mind she needed to say to Lori's mother. It took tact and a calm demeanor to deliver devastating news. She thought it through, and satisfied, she glanced at Kane. First impressions on Rhea? Smart and up to date. Kane turned onto Stanton and headed toward town. He's somewhere between Rowley and Ty Carter. I figure Ty has experience and can take in the whole picture at a crime scene, as if he's reliving it in his head. That comes from working across many crimes. Rowley is still a little green. He's good, but needs direction. But he doesn't need to prove anything to me. He is solid. Jenna took out her notebook and flicked through the pages. It will be interesting to see if Rio's memory is as good as he says. I've read about people like him, and instant recall is amazing. He does seem on the ball, and I liked his take on the crime scene. He is right. This attack on Lori Turner seemed very professional. It has to be someone she knows. Yeah, it seems so. Kane pulled up outside the beauty parlor and stared at her. You gonna be okay? You've gone sheet white. Jenna unclipped her seatbelt and moistened her lips. Yeah, I'll be fine, but come in with me. You have a calming influence in most situations, and you can catch her if she faints. There goes my reputation again. Kane removed his Stetson and ran a hand through his hair before replacing it. Now all the guys in town will think I have a stylist cut my hair. I'll never live it down. Knowing Kane was trying to make light of an awful job, she squeezed his arm and then slid out the trunk. She found Mrs. Turner in the break room sipping coffee. A slim woman with red lips and fingernails and her long hair tied up in an elaborate weave lifted her head from a magazine to stare at her as if she'd grown two heads. We're here about your daughter, Lori. Did you locate her? Mrs. Turner stubbed out a cigarette in an ashtray on the table and looked at Jenna. Jenna shook her head. We're not sure. We found the body of a female earlier today. It could be Lori. She hasn't been identified. A body? What happened to her? Mrs. Turner's voice rose to a panicked shriek. Take me to her. I want to see her. We haven't determined the cause of death. Kane moved into the room and closed the door behind him. She is with a medical examiner. I'm afraid you won't be able to view the body. Then how will you know if it's my lorry? Mrs. Turner's eyes filled with tears that spilled down her cheeks. This can't be happening. Jenna sat beside her. I need a DNA sample from you. A swab from inside your cheek is all. I'll know in less than an hour. Okay. Mrs. Turner dragged in a shuddering breath. It's his fault. Her father refused to allow her to move in with me. He said if I made a fuss, he'd have me declared as an unfit mother. He tells people I'm dead, you know. She shook her head. He's violent. I couldn't live with him a moment longer. I tried to take Lori and run with her. But he obtained a court order and dragged her back. I've had no visitation rights. I've had to sneak time with her. She opened her mouth for Jenna to take the swab. Jenna placed the sample inside the tube and sealed the bag. She stood. You did the right thing, leaving an abusive relationship. His position as a school counselor would have made him believable to the courts, I'm afraid. Not so much now. We support victims of spousal abuse in Black Rock Falls. If this had happened now, you could have come to me for help. Thank you. And yes, I've seen the flyers. Mrs. Turner stood and collected her purse from a bench. I can't stay here doing nothing. 
I'm going to the Emmy's office. I'll wait there for the result. Do you have someone you can call to go with you? Kane had removed his Stetson and was rolling the edge with his fingers. A minister? Close friend? Yeah. Father Derry. Mrs. Turner pulled a bunch of tissues from a box and wiped her eyes. He's been very helpful through all my troubles with Bob. Jenna pulled out a card and handed it to her. I'll call him. Here are my details if you need to contact me. She looked at Mrs. Turner, and the poor woman's grief surrounded her like a heavy weight. Wait a while before you go. It will take a couple of hours before the Emmy has the results. Do you want me to ask Father Derry to meet you here? I don't think you should be driving. Okay. <laughs> Mrs. Turner sniffed. Have you informed Bob? Jenna shook her head. Not yet. We'll speak to him as soon as we have the results of the test. Why can't I see my little girl? Mrs. Turner sat down heavily and peered at her through tears. What happened to her? I'm not able to give you any information. I'm truly sorry. At this stage, we don't know for sure it's Lori. Jenna squeezed the woman's arm. Dr. Wolf, the medical examiner, will explain everything once he has the results of the test. Okay. Mrs. Turner pulled a pack of cigarettes from her pocket and lit up using a silver lighter. She blew out smoke in a stream. I'll wait here for Father Derry. Sure. Jenna stood and headed out the door, pausing at the front counter. Mrs. Turner has had some bad news. Father Derry will be by soon. Can you show him to the break room? Okay. The girl behind the counter nodded like a bobblehead. As they headed for the truck, Jenna looked at Kane. She's in a bad way. Yeah, breathing in fumes all day from the salon and smoking as well. It's a wonder she can breathe at all. He climbed into his truck and started the engine. Wolf's and then Aunt Betty's for lunch? Yeah. Jenna pulled out her phone to call Father Derry. If the DNA results are back by then, we'll go and inform Bob Turner about Lori. I guess then it will be time for the autopsy. Can this day get any worse? Chapter 13 In the school hallway, she paced up and down, chewing her fingernails. She'd taken too many sneers and smart remarks from the cheerleading squad to last her a lifetime. Yeah, they dropped her to the B team, but not for her performance. They'd cut her for one of their friends, a daughter of the local bank manager. She understood the truth now. How the girls on the team manipulated people, using the money or position of their parents to move up in the world. The flirting with her boyfriend and his response had made her mad. He'd been flattered and wouldn't stop talking about how this one or that one had hit on him. Her fingers trembled at the thought of any of them as much as looking at him. She'd won his heart. But since they'd cut her from the squad, she'd noticed his eyes wandering to some of the other girls. She had to put a stop to it and lied to him. Turning the tables on the way the guys thought about cheerleaders hadn't been difficult. His ego was his downfall, and making him believe they had devised a plan to steal him from her, then publicly humiliate him, had been easy. Her plan had worked. He was incredibly vain, and so good-looking, the girls at school idolized him. He walked with a swagger. But she controlled him now. The idea of stealing the players' soiled briefs from the locker room when the team were busy in the showers had been pure genius. But convincing him to take them had been difficult. As he walked toward her at morning break, she dragged him into a quiet corner and kissed him. Did you get them? Yeah. His brow furrowed into a frown. You know, if they catch me doing this, they're going to think I'm kinky or something. Why do we need sweaty shorts? 
And how long do you figure we can get away with this before someone starts complaining their clothes are missing? She took the plastic bag he handed her and thrust it into her backpack. You didn't touch them, did you? You picked them up with the bag? Yeah, I did like the last time. He brushed the hair away from her face and kissed her again. Tell me why you need another pair. It goes way past people thinking Lori was a slut, doesn't it? It's the same reason we wrapped her in plastic and wore gloves. She ran her hand through his hair. DNA. This way the cops will believe someone else killed her. That doesn't seem fair, blaming someone else. He looked worried. That's why I needed another pair. I need to kill another one. She smiled at him. I watched your face when I strangled Lori. You loved it. And I've picked out the next one. We'll stuff the briefs in her mouth to throw off the cops. Two different sets of DNA found with the bodies will confuse them. She looked at him and giggled. <laughs> I'll take out a few of the squad and they'll be begging me to come back. She touched his cheek. Now go and be nice to Becky. Not too nice now. It's the parade tomorrow and everyone will be occupied. We'll need a plan to get her somewhere secluded. There's an empty house in town. I was walking by and saw the last owner leave the key above the front door. We'll go there. All the blinds are down. It will be dark inside, and I can hide real easy. Take her upstairs, and I'll be inside waiting. I'll leave the back door open and have everything ready. Becky deserves this. I've heard her talking. And she really wants to make you look like a jerk. So she'll be putty in your hands. What do you want me to say to her? Hmm, let me see. She twirled her hair around her fingers and thought for a beat. Say you're trying to avoid me. That I follow you. Something like that. We'll need a nice quiet place to get her into your vehicle. She tapped her lip. I know. Ask her to meet you in the library. It's open on Tuesdays until 10. If she shows, make her believe I'm there, stalking you, and then sneak out to the parking lot. Say you'll give her a ride someplace you can make out with her without me knowing. What are you going to do to her? He trembled with excitement against her. Last time, you kind of changed, like in a good way. Watching you made my heart race. And after, when we made out, with her dead eyes watching us, it was incredible. It will be a surprise. She kissed him hard. After she'd killed two or three more cheerleaders, he'd never dream of leaving her. She smiled, enjoying the power she had over him. And this was just the start. Chapter 14 As Jenna and Kane headed back to the office, Wolf called with the results of the DNA sample. The dead girl was Lori Turner. Jenna called off the search at once and headed to Dr. Bob Turner's residence. They parked outside and then walked to the door. Her knocking was answered after a few minutes, and Dr. Turner glared at her. Jenna met his gaze. We have some news about Lori. She's dead, isn't she? My wife called me and told me you'd found a body. Turner's eyes flashed with anger. Jenna glanced at Kane. I'm afraid she is, yes. I gathered as much as you went to my ex-wife to obtain a DNA sample. It would have been more professional to have contacted me first. Dr. Turner's voice became like granite. It's amazing how fast you found Lori's mother. I've been looking for Jeanette for years. She'll blame me for Lori's death, but then she blames me for everything. That woman was always a bad influence on Lori. He cleared his throat. Now can you leave, Sheriff? I don't want your condolences. I have funeral arrangements to make. 
he slammed the door in her face. Jenna exchanged an amazed look with Kane. Is that the same Dr. Turner who called 911? Wow. That's some change around in behavior. People react differently to bad news. Kane raised an eyebrow. It's not your fault. Jenna chewed on her fingers. I guess we should have told him we'd found a body at least. We couldn't ask either parent to physically identify the victim. Kane shrugged. We identified the victim through DNA to prevent the parents being distressed. We didn't know for sure it was Lori Turner. Jenna sighed. It's done now. She climbed inside the truck. I sure could do with a strong cup of coffee. Sure. Kane headed back to town. Inside Aunt Betty's cafe, the wonderful aroma of fresh pie and coffee closed around Jenna like a warm hug. There was something special about the cafe. The name said it all, really. The decor and homely atmosphere brought back memories of her childhood, sitting on her grandma's lap and eating cookies fresh from the oven. Kane was right to bring her here after a grueling morning. Yeah, they could have collected takeout and eaten in her office, but she needed a time out to get her head right before another stressful afternoon. After finishing her meal, she sipped her coffee and allowed her mind to wander. Dr. Turner had taken the news without blinking an eye and talked about arrangements for Lori's funeral, which was a little strange considering how he'd acted the first time they'd met. It had been like speaking to two different people. If he suffered mood swings, he would be the last person she'd consider capable of advising troubled kids. As soon as Kane had placed his empty cup on the table, Jenna pushed to her feet. Let's go. I need to drop by the office. As they drove through town, she scanned her notes on the investigation. When she returned to the office, she'd need to set her deputies to work. They had to go through Lori's laptop. And she'd be interested to know if Wolf had had time to check out her phone. She glanced up as Kane slowed to avoid a group of people spilling onto the road. When he hit his siren, a woman clutching a baby to her chest burst through the crowd and ran toward them. What now? Help me, please. The woman's long blonde hair was a mess. Tears had tracked mascara down her cheeks. In her arms, a baby screamed. The woman hammered on Kane's door. Don't let him hit me again. I won't let him near you. Kane turned to Jenna. Orders. Jenna assessed the situation. Take care of her. I'll go see what this bunch of cowards are doing, standing by and watching a woman being assaulted. Call for backup. Jenna. Kane stared at her. Don't say a word. The townsfolk need to know I can deal with trouble alone. I know you care about my safety. Jenna glared at him. My town, my problem. Let me do my job, Dave. Okay. He held up both hands in surrender. Go do your job. But just remember, people like to see a strong leader, not one who's trying to prove they can knock a guy off his feet. He smiled at her. Even if you can. He waved a hand toward the group of men cheering the offender on. Then you have the crowd. If they step in, I'm there, and nothing you say will stop me. That's what I'm paid to do, Jenna. Your first priority is the woman and her baby. Jenna climbed out the truck and pushed her way through the group of men spilling from Antlers, the new tavern in town. She didn't recognize any of them as locals, and as they all had the same club jackets, Clearly, they belonged to a group of men on a hunting trip or similar. She raised her voice. What's going on here? Nothing for you to be looking at, Sheriff. A man with a smug expression stepped away from his friends. It's a private matter. He wiped blood from his knuckles onto his jeans. Ain't it, boys? After murmuring their agreement, all eyes turned to her. Many of the men had grins from ear to ear. Indignant, Jenna straightened. Assaulting people in my town is an offense. She hit me first. The man rubbed his cheek. I was just showing the boys here how I deal with a wife who just won't listen. 
I told her I'd be away this week, and she goes and follows me here. Then she takes offense to me chatting with the girl behind the bar. I mean... He opened his hands out wide and flashed her a lopsided smile. What woman wouldn't want a piece of this? He looked around as his friends laughed. I gave her a baby to keep her quiet, but she don't stay quiet. Following me here, checking up on me, that makes me look weak. Jenna shook her head. I'm taking you downtown for a little chat. The townsfolk hereabouts don't like men who beat on their wives. I'll get my deputies to speak to the witnesses. She ain't gonna press charges against me. He glared at Jenna. Do you figure you're strong enough to cuff me? He pointed to her sidearm. Oh, that's right. You'll hold a gun to my head. He looked around at his friends and grinned. Get out your phones, boys. Police brutality coming my way. His gaze shifted back to Jenna. I'll have your badge, lady. You don't know who you're dealing with. People had collected on the sidewalk. To one side, she made out Kane getting the woman and her baby inside his truck. He looked over the top of the beast and raised both eyebrows. Jenna gave him a slight shake of her head, unbelted her duty belt, and handed it to the local gun store owner. Okay, now it's just you and me. She shrugged. What's your name? John Law, and I ain't going nowhere. He stood his ground, hands on hips, grinning at her. It's easy for you hiding behind a badge. If I make the wrong move, you'll have me for resisting arrest. Noticing Rowley pushing through the crowd, she smiled at him. Here, hold these for me, please. She peeled off her jacket and handed Rowley her badge. There, that makes us even. Even? <laughs> Law laughed at her. The badge and coat don't make you a sheriff. The town makes you the sheriff. Whatever. Stay out of my business. He turned to walk toward a pickup. Jenna charged after him and grabbed one arm. I'm arresting you for assaulting your wife. She pulled his arm up behind him and reached for the other, cuffs in hand. In an instant, he twisted around. The slap caught her across the cheek like a whip, and she tasted blood. She ducked his second blow and caught the rage on his face. He planned to strike her again, and that was not going to happen. The years of training she'd done with Kane in the early hours of the morning had prepared her for men like Law. They liked to dominate and control. Rather than get mad, everything around her went into slow motion. Out of the corner of her eye, she could see Kane restraining Rowley. She ducked the next slap, and Law, red in the face, came at her like a raging bull, his fists clenched. Perfect. Kane had taught her how to disable by aiming in just the right place. She spun and kicked, hitting Law's kneecap with the heel of her boot. One strike, and he fell into a pile of pain. She turned and looked at Rowley and Kane. Cuff him. She read him his rights. When you get him in a cell, call Doc Brown but I want him charged with assaulting a law officer, resisting arrest, and spousal abuse. Yes, ma'am. Rowley cuffed Law and dragged him limping to his cruiser. You broke my leg! I'm going to sue you! This is police brutality! Law's face contorted. You're dead, lady. My friends have everything on film. Jenna collected her things and buckled on her duty belt. That's good. And so do many of the local townsfolk. The judge will see you resisting arrest and striking me. She touched her cheek and ran her tongue over the split side of her mouth. You came at me first, Law, a defenseless woman. I just defended myself. She turned to Rowley. Get him out of my sight. Do you want me to collect the phone footage? Rio was at her side. Jenna shook her head and scanned the crowd. No, I'll do that. I know many of the people who filmed it. Take Mrs. Law and her baby to her broken wings. It's a refuge for battered women. Two streets up on the left. 
Get her statement. Explain we'll need her to testify in court or he'll walk. She turned to the crowd and raised her voice. I'll need the footage. As people came forward, her heart sank at the sight of Denny Crawford, the impossibly rude Blackwater News reporter heading her way with a satisfied smile. Talk about being in the right place at the right time. The busybody reporter had caught the entire episode on film. She turned to face her. No comment. Oh, come on, Sheriff. Crawford held out the microphone. You must have something to say to the people of Black Rock Falls. She smiled at the camera. It's not every day we see a sheriff in action while her deputies stand by and do nothing. Refusing to rise to the bait, Jenna looked straight into the camera. In Black Rock Falls, we don't tolerate spousal abuse or bullying. So please donate to Her Broken Wings Foundation and help those in need. Thank you. She turned her back on Crawford and addressed the crowd. Okay, who filmed the incident? She took out her cards. Email a copy to me, please. As she moved between the people, she noticed Kane coming out of Antlers carrying something. He stopped at his truck and leaned against the door, watching her. With all the footage emailed to her and names taken of witnesses, she made her way back to the beast. She looked at Kane's stern expression, but he said nothing, and just handed her a towel filled with ice. She took it from him and pressed it against her throbbing cheek. Now the adrenaline had worn off, her face ached. She looked at them. How is Mrs. Law? Frightened and hurting? Kane frowned. Her husband has been beating on her for some time. I wanted to tend her injuries, but she wanted to feed the baby and told me to leave her alone. Jenna watched as Rio escorted the woman to his cruiser. Let's go before that news reporter films anything else I'm doing. She climbed into the beast and waited for Kane to get behind the wheel and start the engine. I saw you holding Rally back. Thanks for letting me deal with the situation, but I wasn't expecting it to be all over the news tonight. You made it perfectly clear you had a point to prove. Kane was staring straight ahead. The big, loudmouth bully who beat up on his wife needed taking down a peg. Being knocked off his feet by a woman your size in front of his friends will take a long time to live down, especially when it makes the news. It's just as well his wife is leaving him. He'd take it out on her, for sure. He pulled into his space outside the sheriff's department and turned to look at her. It's difficult, Jenna. He pointed to his chest. In here, seeing Law put his hands on you made me want to tear him apart. But in here, he pointed to his head. I knew you could take care of yourself, but when you gave up your weapon, Jesus, Jenna. He shook his head. I had palpitations. Jenna smiled at him. You retrained me well, and I'm at my peak. But I have to admit, knowing you were there watching my back made it a whole lot easier. Chapter 15 Head throbbing, Jenna walked into the sheriff's department to find a towhee Blackhawk waiting for her. Maggie had supplied him with coffee and sandwiches. Her friend looked weary, and she smiled at him. Thank you so much for searching all night. We found a body out at the old mines, and Wolf has just confirmed it's Lori Turner. That's some way from where I found her backpack. It belongs to Lori. It has a tag with her name on it. Blackhawk lifted a large evidence bag from beside his chair and handed it to her. I decided to ride my trail bike through the forest, and it was on the trail we searched yesterday, about half a mile from Stanton. I marked the place with tape and have the coordinates. He held up his phone. I took shots of the trail and all around, but whoever dropped it there didn't leave a trace. I'll forward them to everyone now. Jenna stared at the backpack. She'd take it to Wolf when they went to the autopsy. We're looking for a primary crime scene, and it may be close to where you found this. We'll go and check it out. Did you touch it or go through it? Nah. 
Black Ox shook his head. I have a pocket full of gloves and evidence bags with me, in case we found anything during the search. He sipped his coffee and regarded her with interest. What happened to your face? Jenna closed the door and sat in her office chair. Some crazy wife beater. He's in the cells and will be on his way to the county jail as soon as he's charged. How did your deputies allow this to happen? His brown eyes flashed with anger. Men who beat on women are contemptible. Surprised by his concern, she smiled. I'm fine. I wanted to handle him myself, but it was a little difficult. I ordered Kane and Rowley to stand down. She stood and filled a coffee cup and then searched the drawer for Tylenol. Rio is taking her to her broken wings. They'll make sure she gets the best of care and assistance. She took her coffee back to the desk. Have you met Zach Rio yet? I have. Blackhawk nodded slowly. He seems efficient, but I'd say you have another overqualified deputy in your team. He's ambitious. Have you considered he might go against you in the next election? I know that's years away, but by that time, he'll be well established in town. Jenna tossed the towel and ice into the sink and looked at him. That's way too far into the future for me to worry about. And my head is filled with this case. She indicated to the whiteboard. We've gone from missing girl to murder victim in the last few hours. As soon as Rio gets back, he can handle the press. Because as soon as they get wind that I called off the search, they'll know we found a body. Do you know how she died? Blackhawk turned his hat around in his hands and looked at her. I didn't see any blood spatter. Nothing at all around her backpack. I did a good recon of the area. Having been with Blackhawk on a search in the forest many a time, she had seen his skills firsthand. A superb tracker, he was an asset and gave his time freely, refusing payment as if it was an insult. She valued his friendship on all levels. She'd trust him with her life. Jenna nodded. We won't know until the autopsy. This one is difficult. Maybe strangulation with post-mortem wounds. The autopsy is at two. I'll know more then. A brief knock came on her door, and Kane walked inside with Duke at his heels and nodded at Blackhawk. I've checked out Lori's laptop. It wasn't password protected. There's nothing there at all unusual. The friends we've spoken to already make up the social media contacts. Her emails are very general. Even her search history is based on her assignments. No clues there at all. Not even a nasty comment. Jenna stood and added information to the whiteboard, and then turned to Kane. A toe he found her backpack. We'll take it to Wolf to examine. Yeah, I read the file. Kane went to the counter and poured himself a cup of coffee. You sure you weren't a cop in your past life? Me? <laughs> Blackhawk chuckled. Who really knows which way their spirit guide has led them? Although I don't like putting men in cages, so perhaps not. He shrugged. But if I saw a rabid dog, I'd take it down without a second thought. He grinned at Kane. Don't look so concerned, Eagle Eye. I have no plans to start murdering people. It is not in my nature, and I find digging holes too much of a chore. Jenna looked up as Rowley and Rio arrived at her office door. She waved them in. What do you have for me? Mrs. Law is in safe hands at her broken wings. She lives out at Luan, and we've arranged for her to go and collect her belongings while her husband is in custody. Rio handed her a document. She gave me a statement and will press charges for assault. The social workers at the shelter have everything under control. They've even arranged a pro bono lawyer to represent her, if necessary. Yeah, we took the charge sheet and evidence to date to the DA, along with Mrs. Law's statement and ours. We had enough to obtain an arrest warrant. Rowley looked pleased with himself. The DA wants statements from you and Kane, and any witnesses willing to come forward to support his case. Law will be held in county waiting for a bail hearing. They're on their way to collect him. Glad she had such efficient deputies, Jenna smiled. Good to know. We'll get the statements before we leave for the autopsy, 
and you can drop them into the DA's office. I'm happy Mrs. Law and her baby are being cared for in Black Rock Falls. She'll have a fresh start here. She clasped her hands around her coffee cup. We're due to attend an autopsy at two. Rally, I need you to start chasing down the witnesses in the law case. The contact details are in the files. It would be easier if you could call them and ask them to come in to make a statement, and then you'll be here for the transfer of our prisoner. She glanced at Rio. Rio is attending the autopsy, but he'll be back to relieve you as soon as possible. Rather him than me. Rally ran a hand through his unruly hair. The smell of that place makes me sick to my stomach. He swiped at the end of his nose. I'll get at it. He headed for the door. I'll need you to sign off on the media release, please, Sheriff. Rio placed a sheet of paper on her desk. Jenna read through it and was impressed by the presentation, which gave the barest details and none of the evidence found at the scene. I can see you've written a few of these in your time. Great job. Ask Maggie for our media contact details and call it in. She signed the bottom of the page and handed it back to him. Taking a few seconds to put her thoughts in order, Jenna waited for Blackhawk to finish his coffee and then smiled at him. I really appreciate your help. The backpack might give up valuable evidence. Anytime. Blackhawk looked at Jenna and stood. I'm only a call away if you need me. He yawned. I'm heading home to get some rest. I don't envy your next job, Jenna. I hope Shane can give you a clue to finding this killer. He pushed his hat on his head and followed Rio out the door. Jenna stared after him. That's one drawback about being sheriff. She grimaced. I don't have an excuse to avoid an autopsy. She met Kane's combat face. He was already zoning out his emotions. Although this case is intriguing, she sighed in its own horrific way. Chapter 16 Stealing herself for the gruesome task ahead, Jenna tried to ignore the smell of the morgue and the cold that seeped through her clothes. She heard Kane clear his throat and Rio's boots click on the tile as they walked in a procession, her in the lead, to the examination room, with the glowing red light outside. Her deputies' faces were grim as they shed their jackets and suited up for the autopsy. The air filled with mentholated salve, and gloves snapped into place. Once everyone was ready, she scanned her card at the door, and they all stepped inside. As usual, Wolf had completed the preliminary examination before they arrived. Screens held x-ray images and an assortment of results from various tests he'd already conducted in their absence. They walked to stand a little to the side of Wolf, Emily, and Cold Weber to peer at the victim's body on a gurney under the bright light. As they turned to look at them, she held up the evidence bag. A toe he found Lori's backpack. Where do you want it? Emily and Colt will go through it in another room. Wolf waved them away. I want this room as clean as possible. Jenna handed Weber the plastic bag and smiled at Emily behind her mask. Last semester, you must be excited. What's next? Tons. I'm planning on completing an accelerated medical degree. Then I'll have at least two years of residency before I can apply to be certified. There's a ton more studying to do if I want to specialize in forensic pathology. Right now, I'm more concerned about the postgrad finals. Emily shrugged. I'm usually confident going into examinations, but this means so much to me. I'm a little nervous. Sometimes that's a good thing. Kane wiggled his eyebrows. Overconfidence can be a curse. You always say something to make me feel better. Emily squeezed his arm and then hurried after Weber. Before we start, Wolf moved his attention to Jenna. The last text Lori made was at five on Saturday evening. I went through everything going back a month. It is all general Chad. The only interesting text between her and Wyatt Cooper, the boyfriend, was about him being annoyed about the attention Corey Hughes, the maintenance man, was giving her. It was then they broke up. 
Lori told him she didn't like jealousy and blocked his calls. That's motive, Jenna considered the information. Cooper was at the practice and could have followed her. If she needed a ride, she'd likely get in his vehicle. She looked at Kane. We'll need to see what he drives. She turned back to Wolf. What else do you have for me? We have some trace evidence, Wolf indicated to the screen. The men's briefs are a generic brand and untraceable, but they held significant amounts of DNA. We also found a trace of foreign saliva on the screwdriver and extracted a good DNA sample. He moved to the screen. The samples are unrelated to the victim and each other. He puffed out a long sigh. Both, of course, are useless unless we find a match. As Cooper and Hughes had some involvement with Lori, I'd start there, but it will be a huge task. I'd suggest you call in Joe Wells and ask if Bobby Kahlo can run the samples through the FBI databases. It's a bit early to call in the FBI. Kane frowned. We'll get those samples and hunt down a few suspects before we contact them. So we don't look like complete jerks. It's your call. Wolf went back to staring at the results. This case is complicated, and I'd have thought you'd appreciate some input from Joe. She's a friend. She won't pull the FBI card if you don't specifically ask her to intervene in the case. Fine. Kane didn't look amused. I'll call her if I can't figure out this guy. Excited by the evidence, Jenna stared at the screen. So we may have two suspects. Yeah, there's a chance. Wolf's gray eyes flicked to her. I figured the saliva was an error and the briefs a message. Rio examined the results. He looked at Kane. What do you think? I'll be listening to what Wolf has to say before making any decisions or running to the FBI for help. Kane shrugged. Seems to me the killers went to extreme measures not to leave any trace evidence. Jenna lifted her gaze to the images on the screen. Wolf had photographed both sides of the body. She looked at him. We're interrupting you. Please go on. Okay. Wolf used a remote to bring up another set of x-rays. There's no sign of blunt force trauma outside the perimeter of the stab wounds. As you can see of the 22 stab wounds on the face, eyes, and torso, in 10, we have evidence of damage to the underlying bone. The hyoid bone is fractured, but the larynx isn't crushed. He turned to look at them. I took samples of blood, and I'm running a tox screen as routine, but I tested specifically for a variety of sedatives to rule out the date rape scenario. I found no trace of any sedative in her system, and I found no latent prints on her body. Jenna examined the body. Apart from the stab wounds and neck bruising, the body only had a few superficial bruises. There were no defensive wounds. Any sign of sexual activity? No. Wolf walked to the body. I've already mentioned the liver mortis, but as you can see from the extent in the lower regions of the body, she was in a sitting position for some time, perhaps eight hours or more before being relocated. I found something notable as well. He looked at Kane. If you could help me turn her over. Sure. Kane moved the body with great care and gentleness. The unease drained away from Jenna as the need to know what happened to Lori Turner took precedence, and she moved closer. Oh, I see it. There's a crease on her back. I took swabs, as decomposing skin collects trace elements like a magnet. There were dust particles. Nothing special, but I found traces of polyethylene. In my opinion, she was wrapped in plastic, or was at least lying on plastic. The plastic sheet was creased and caused the mark on her back. This would account for the clean crime scene and the light coating of sandy soil on the body at the scene. Jenna nodded, seeing the scene unfold in her head. The killer wrapped her in plastic and took her to the mines, where he stabbed her post-mortem as you've established. That would account for the bodily fluid spatter. And then after tossing the screwdriver down the mine shaft, he rolled her out of the plastic, 
covered his tracks and headed for the hills. He winded back some. Kane was examining the back of Lori's neck. He'd lifted the hair and was peering at the crossed over mark on the neck. She was sitting for some time on plastic. But who just sits on a plastic sheet and waits to be strangled? He glanced at Wolf. I've seen this before. It's a classic attack from behind. He followed the mark to under the jawbone. It's under the chin. I figure we've two people involved. One driver and the killer in the back seat, perhaps hiding. Lori climbs in and the driver pulls away. The second drops a cord around her neck and crosses it over, pulling her up and over the seat. Maybe she had her seatbelt on and was pinned. He lifted his attention back to Wolf. Did you find any trace under her nails? No, and she'd have blacked out in about ten seconds. Wolf motioned for Kane to assist him rolling her onto her back. The stab wounds are all inflicted by the same instrument. They differ in depth, which would indicate the attack continued until they tired. The main concentration is in the face and breast areas. I've seen something similar. Rio was standing arms folded over his chest and leaning against a counter. It was a case where a guy's wife murdered his girlfriend, but she used a kitchen knife. The same attack pattern, face and chest. Jenna nodded. That's good to know. So we could be looking at a spurned lover, perhaps? She stared at Kane. Although she seems too young to be involved in a love triangle. We could be looking at a female killer. Kane narrowed his gaze. A very jealous woman. Mulling over the situation, Jenna nodded. Maybe two female suspects. She stared at Kane. She'd more likely take the offer of a ride from a woman, or even two. More like she knew the driver. Kane shrugged. That's the impression of the witness, and from her clear descriptions of everything else, I'd say she doesn't miss much. Getting back to the autopsy, Wolf pulled down the mic to record his findings. We have the body of Lori Turner, age 16 years and two months. Caucasian, brown eyes and hair. She is average height and weight for her age. The injuries to the upper torso and face, number 22, and are consistent in size and shape of a screwdriver found at the scene. Trace evidence on the screwdriver is a match for Lori Turner, and foreign DNA was located in an overlay, suggesting it arrived after the cessation of the attack. He turned off the mic and looked at Jenna and her team. I'll pause for questions, but I need to keep the audio record undisturbed, so I'll need to make an exact copy of my findings for the report. Jenna took a step back as the examination of the body followed. This was the part that usually caused even the most experienced law enforcement officers to buckle. Organs removed, examined, weighed, and samples of stomach contents taken made her glance away a few times to catch her breath. She didn't have to worry about Kane. He seemed to take everything in his stride and was assisting Wolf, but her interest wandered to Rio. He had surprised her so far. On the job, his input was intelligent, and he knew his stuff. It was no different in the morgue. His gaze hadn't shifted from the autopsy, as if he was mentally filing every detail. And perhaps he was. He showed a keen interest in his eyes and was listening intently to Wolf's every word. For a young man, he had knowledge beyond his years, and as a person, she liked him. He'd fit into the team just fine, and for her to make that judgment on his first day was remarkable. Her attention snapped back to Wolf the moment he started talking again. Stab wounds vary in depth and angle. The depth is from two and a half inches to half an inch on the chest, and there are two four-inch incisions on the lower torso. Wolf glanced up at Jenna. I count ten wounds to the chest and lower torso, and twelve wounds to the face. He turned off the mic as Emily and Weber came back into the room. Ah, good. Emily. Take over and complete the sutures. He turned on the mic. 
My conclusion is that cause of death is homicide by asphyxiation due to strangulation by an unknown subject. All other injuries were inflicted post-mortem by person or persons unknown at this time. He turned off the mic and looked at Jenna. All my findings will be in my full report. Jenna turned to Emily. Was there anything of interest in the backpack? Not inside, no. Just the usual things a girl would need at practice, but her pom-poms were missing. They usually have their own for practice. We found quite a few different sets of prints on the backpack and some fibers that could be from the interior carpet of a vehicle. They look too fine to be from a rug or similar. We've entered all the information on file, and the samples are waiting for processing. Jenna looked at Kane. We'd have to print everyone at the practice, all her friends and her father, to use for elimination. It's a waste of time. Kane shook his head. If they took so much care to cover trace evidence, they wouldn't handle the backpack without gloves. They dropped it miles away from her body to put us off their trail. I'll be looking more closely at the fibers. Rio moved closer. She would drop her backpack on the floor between her legs. When she got into the vehicle. If the backpack has picked up some fibers, we could trace them to the vehicle. We know the make, and once we know the model and year, it would be easy to narrow down the owner. Leave it with me. Wolf pulled down his face mask and headed for the door. I'll get to it immediately. Jenna turned to Kane and Rio. Let's go. She followed Wolf out the door. There's so many databases we need to search. Bringing in the FBI computer whiz kid, Bobby Kalo, would make life so much easier. I'm calling Joe the moment we get back to the office. Are you okay with that? Sure. Kane dragged off his mask and smiled at her. This case is going to need all the boots on the ground we can muster. Chapter 17 Outside the Emmy's office, Jenna sucked in gulps of fresh mountain air, but the smell of death lingered in her nostrils, as if it had taken up permanent residence. She followed Kane to his truck and leaned against the door, just breathing. At the end of the road, she could see people milling around Maine. The preparations were in full swing for the fall festival parade the following day. The theme this year was sport, and local teams would present their players on floats. A band, followed by cheerleading squads, would march down Maine, and the mayor would officially open the festival. The rest of the week would be filled with excitement. And although at times the tourists could be a problem, she looked forward to the bunting, smiling faces, balloons, and cotton candy. All festivals brought a myriad of aromas, from the fried onions, barbecued ribs, and the famous pulled pork, to the cake and candy stalls. She almost wanted to roll in it with delight. There goes our dance at the fall festival. Kane slid an arm around her shoulder and gave her a squeeze. I was looking forward to having my toes crushed again this year. He grinned at her. For someone who can learn hand-to-hand -hand combat moves so easily, I can't understand why you can't dance. He winced when she dug him in the ribs. Although you're getting better, Jenna snorted. Have you thought it might be you? She poked him again. I didn't step on Ty's feet when we danced at Antlers. Yeah, but Carter was holding you way out here. Kane spread his arms. He has a keen eye and probably noticed the scuffs on my boots. Jenna rolled her eyes. Thanks, Dave. I feel so much better now. She ducked away and headed around the hood. I guess we'd better get back to the office. I figure we should hunt down Corey Hughes first. He should be at the school at this time. Kane opened his door. If he's innocent, he'll give up his DNA sample, but we'll have to obtain permission from Wyatt Cooper's parents to test him. Jenna nodded. Sure, and we need the samples yesterday. Let's go. She stared out the window, wanting to be part of the organizing happening in town. She often helped out here or there her deputies saving some of the older townsfolk from the heavy lifting. But she only got a glimpse of Maine 
as Kane took the back roads. After a few turns, they sped along Stanton toward the school. The parking lot was empty, but they passed a few kids walking home in groups. From what Hughes said, he parks round back. Okay. Kane drove around the main building and parked behind a white pickup. Jenna wrinkled her nose at the smell coming from the line of dumpsters and buzzed up her window. She scanned the area. The back door is open. Maybe he's working close by. I hope so. We've been away from the office for hours. Kane climbed out and went to the back of his truck. I'll grab a DNA test kit. Jenna stared at him. If you're worrying about Duke, don't. Maggie will be feeding him snacks, and he'll probably be sleeping them off. Maybe, but he doesn't know Rio. Kane pushed surgical gloves into his pocket and shrugged. With him working next to me, he might think I've been replaced. He doesn't like strangers. He looked at her. I figure if he gets worried, he'll head back to the res. You should see him there, Jenna. He gets so excited. I didn't think the dogs remembered their mothers, but he does. I often wonder if I should have given him to a towie. Jenna ignored the stink of garbage and stared at him in disbelief. Are you joking? When you spent time in the hospital, he howled at the door and insisted I take him to every room in the cottage to look for you. He slept under the beast for weeks and refused to eat. I had to drag him out and then give him one of your dirty shirts to sleep on and hand feed him in his basket. He might be excited to see his mom, but you are his world. She looked at him uncomprehending. You must know that, right? You never told me that before. Kane's brow wrinkled into a frown. Jenna shook her head. No, because you weren't you when you came home from the hospital. You didn't remember me, let alone Duke. I did remember Duke. Kane removed his hat and rubbed the scar on his head. Selective memory. He cupped her cheek. Sorry, I remember everything just fine now. You saved my life, and I abandoned you. Jenna moved closer. You came home. She smiled at him. Even with no memory, you came home with me. You're with me now. That's all that matters. I'm a lucky man. Kane brushed a kiss over her lips, and then stiffened and looked over her shoulder and dropped his hand. I think it was just a bug in your hair, Sheriff. What? Jenna noticed Corey Hughes leaning against the doorframe, grinning like a baboon. It was obvious Kane was trying to conceal a tender moment from prying eyes. She cleared her throat. What's so funny, Mr. Hughes? Well, it's not often I see the sheriff and one of her deputies making out with the trash. Hughes chuckled. I'll leave you two lovebirds alone. Annoyed, Jenna marched toward him. The last thing they needed was Hughes spreading rumors all over town. If asking someone to pull a bug out of my hair is your idea of making out, I think you need professional help. She followed him inside. Don't go anywhere. I'm here to see you. I gave my statement and have nothing more to add. He led the way inside the school. We're eliminating the last people to see Lori Turner alive from our investigation. Kane moved to her side. We'll need a DNA swab from inside your mouth. It's painless, and if you're not involved in her murder, you have no need to be concerned. Murder? Hughes paled. Last I heard, she went missing. She's dead? How? What happened to her? He looked at her wide-eyed. Either Hughes was in shock, or he was great at play-acting. She'd witnessed psychopaths act remorseful when they had no empathy whatsoever, and usually went by her gut feeling during interviews. The cause of death is under investigation. There was DNA found on her body. And we're collecting samples from all her friends. We're not accusing you of anything. This way, if you had nothing to do with her death, it takes suspicion away from you. I'd never hurt Lori. Hughes rubbed both hands down his face. I knew she liked me, but getting involved with a 16-year-old would cost me my job. I told her to go make up with Wyatt when she broke her phone. 
he dashed a hand through his hair. She kissed me on the cheek and ran out the door giggling. Did you follow her? Kane's voice was so low, Jenna could hardly hear him. Sweet young thing like her. No one would know, right? Jenna understood Kane's unsavory comment about Lori as an interviewing technique used by FBI profilers during questioning. It made the suspect believe the interviewer was of like mind and often prompted a response. Perpetrators often enjoyed talking about their exploits to like-minded people. No, I didn't follow her. Hughes straightened. I went home, like I told you. His eyes flashed with anger. I'd never hurt Lori. I'll give a DNA sample to prove it. Easily said from a killer who knew he'd covered his tracks. Jenna nodded. Thank you. I didn't realize she was a close friend. I'm sorry for your loss. She motioned toward Kane. Deputy Kane will take the sample. Jenna noticed a screwdriver in his top pocket. It was a different color to the one they'd found at the crime scene. Do you always carry that particular screwdriver? Yeah. Hughes looked puzzled. This one is the right size to fit just about everything in the school, so I keep it handy. Does anyone in your household own a Chrysler sedan? Kane was gloving up, and his voice had become almost conversational. Yeah, my mom has one. It's an old one. She don't drive it much. Hughes opened his mouth for Kane to swab. Thanks. Kane sealed the sample and asked Hughes to sign the form. Is it green by any chance? Yeah. Why? Hughes wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. She run a red light or something? Not that I'm aware. Kane sealed the evidence bag. Does your sister drive the vehicle? Sometimes. Hughes frowned and shifted from one foot to the other. But she's not long gotten her license. Jenna took in the change of demeanor. Why didn't you inform me about the vehicle at the meeting at the gym? I did ask if anyone knew someone with a green Chrysler sedan. It was right after we spoke about the phone. I guess I didn't hear you. Hughes scratched his head. I'd gone to get Lori's phone for you, remember? His excuse was plausible, and he cooperated so far. Jenna nodded. Yeah, that's right. You left before I made the announcement. She thought for a beat and changed tact. Did Verna get along with Lori? Verna was on the same cheerleading squad as her, wasn't she? Yeah, they were, but they didn't get along. Hughes looked defensive. Now don't you go thinking anything nasty about Verna. She's had a bad life. My parents fostered her for a year and then adopted her. People don't understand her, is all. Do you get along? Kane's voice had dropped to a whisper. It would be strange having a teenager move in. I'm not sure I'd like to share my parents with a stranger. It's not like that at all. Hughes shook his head. Darn it. She's my best friend. I'm glad she's one of the family now. He frowned. I'm glad she's there. Since Pa walked out, Ma has become a pain and blames me for everything. Like it's my fault he left her. It's hard for everyone when folks break up. Kane grimaced. We have everything we need. Thank you for your time. As they climbed back into the beast, Jenna turned to Kane. Did you get a vibe from him? He wasn't acting like a guy who thought Lori was too young for him, and someone who might cause him to lose his job if he became involved with her. I would suspect his reaction from a longtime lover. His words said one thing, and his actions another. Kane started the engine and backed out. That was overkill. If his mom owns a Chrysler sedan, we only have his word he was driving his truck on Saturday night. If he parks in the same place, it would have been out of sight. Or Verna was driving it. The possible scenario dropped into Jenna's mind. She could see where Kane was going. He was working here on Saturday night and could have easily disabled Lori's pickup. She frowned. 
But how did he make her drop her phone? Verna? Kane turned back onto Stanton. From what everyone was saying, there was quite a crowd in the parking lot that night. They were all excited about the festival, making plans and such. Maybe she followed her outside and bumped into her. All the girls of her age are always carrying their phones and talking. They live in their own worlds. Most never know what's happening around them. Jenna thought for a while. I'm not so sure. It seems to me he could have had Lori. She fancied him, and the attack on her looks too much like something a jealous woman would do. And he admitted Verna didn't like her. She shook her head. We might be looking at this the wrong way. The killer might be Verna. Maybe. But it would be difficult to murder her and then move her body alone. And men attack women's faces as well. Kane grimaced. I need to speak to Joe. I've read something about a killer who attacked the eyes of his victims. In that case, he knew all of them. It might be a trait. If they can't look at him, he's not responsible. I'll need to dig deeper. Chapter 18 After leaving the school, Kane headed to the home of Wyatt Cooper. There would be a chance he'd be home by now, and maybe one of his parents would be there to sign the consent form. As they pulled up outside the rambling ranch-style home, he glanced at Jenna. Fingers crossed we get this done today. We need answers. I'm just hoping Lori's death is the result of a bad argument, and not the first in a line of cheerleader murders. Jenna pushed open her door. I feel like the clock is ticking, and we're getting closer to finding another corpse. She looked at him as she rounded the hood. I figure we'll need Verna's DNA as well. I'm still not discounting her involvement, or Hughes's, in this case. After gathering another test kit, Kane followed her to the front of the house. After Jenna pressed the bell, a woman in her late thirties opened the door and stood staring at them with an astonished expression. He nodded to her. Mrs. Cooper? Yes? Mrs. Cooper stood as if guarding the doorway, both hands clutching the doorframe. Is something wrong? Not at all. Jenna smiled at the woman. We're collecting DNA samples and fingerprints to eliminate suspects in Lori Turner's murder. We'd like to get a sample from Wyatt if he's home. We just heard on the news about her death. Mrs. Cooper pressed a hand to her chest. She was such a sweet girl. Wyatt is heartbroken. She shook her head. I guess you'd better come inside. I'll go and get him. Kane followed Jenna through the door, and they waited in the hallway at the foot of the stairs. The scent of lavender furniture polish filled the house and exploded a wave of memories for him. His mother had always made her own polish, using beeswax and lavender oil. He recalled her telling him how it made everything shine, even his boots. Upstairs, they could hear mumbled conversations and Wyatt Cooper appeared at the top of the steps. Have you found out who killed her? Wyatt shook his head slowly. If only I'd waited. She would have been okay. I was too pig-headed and figured she'd get jealous seeing me talking to Becky. We wouldn't be here chasing down DNA samples if we'd found her killer. Jenna was regarding him closely. You can't blame yourself, Wyatt. It's the killer's fault, not yours. And we'll find out who did this to her. You have my word. Thanks. Wyatt looked at Kane. I can't believe the mayor is going ahead with the festival with Lori dead and all. It doesn't seem right. We're expected to show, too, like nothing happened. The show must go on, Kane nodded. When something like this happens, it's sometimes best to allow life to go on as normal. It's a traumatic event, and normality is the best cure. He met the young man's troubled gaze. We need DNA. Yeah, Mom just told me. Wyatt frowned. Do you need to take blood? No, just a swab. Jenna smiled at him. Open your mouth. 
She took the sample. There you go. That was easy. After pulling the fingerprint scanner device from his pocket, Kane moved closer. This is painless, too. He guided Wyatt through the process. Thank you for your cooperation. That's okay. Wyatt rubbed the back of his neck. I hope you find who killed Lori. Kane waited for Mrs. Cooper to join them. I have some paperwork for you to sign. He rested the documents on a side table and explained the contents. Thank you. He sighed. We'll get going. We have to get this sample back to the lab. I'm so sorry for your loss. Jenna headed for the door. As they drove away, Kane turned to her. Now that was genuine grief. Blaming himself is normal. He felt responsible for her and wanted her back. I don't see him as jealous. He seems like a normal, healthy teenager to me. Jenna shook her head. But then Ted Bundy was regarded as a really nice guy, too. And he murdered 36 women. He makes the psychopaths we've had to deal with in Black Rock Falls look like amateurs. After dropping by the ME's office to give the samples to Wolf, Kane took the back roads back to the office to avoid the crowds. They arrived a little before five to see Duke's nose pressed against the door. From the marks spread across the glass, he'd been there for some time. As Kane stepped inside, a bark of excitement greeted him, followed by a happy dance of epic proportions. He was used to having an excited dog weighing a little over 100 pounds charging at him, but it was only by his quick reflexes he managed to catch Jenna before she headbutted the front counter. As she hung over his arm, Duke was licking her face with enthusiasm. Hey, settle down, Duke. We're happy to see you too, but Jenna doesn't need a bath. Oh, he'd said the B word, and Duke stopped moving and hightailed it under Maggie's desk. Kane straightened and tried not to laugh at the saliva dripping from Jenna's chin. Sorry, he was just being loving. Yuck, she shuddered. I told you he'd be frantic. She headed for the bathroom. I need to wash up. There's someone here to see you. Maggie was grinning from ear to ear. Those FBI agents and their dogs. She glanced down beside her. But best you settle Duke. He's shaking so much. If I put my feet on him, I'd get a foot massage. Kane nodded. Sure. He smiled and pulled a bag of cookies from his jacket pocket. Duke, I have cookies. He coaxed him out and rubbed his ears. I'm sorry we took so long. We'll go by Aunt Betty's on the way home, okay? It seemed the cure for all that ailed Duke was covered by cookies and the mention of Aunt Betty's cafe. Kane leaned on the counter. Any idea why Joe and Carter are here? They didn't say, Maggie shrugged. They arrived about five minutes ago, and they're not wearing their FBI jackets. Kane nodded. We're Rowley and Rio. In the communications room, she smiled. They work well together. They had people lining up to give statements in the law case and had them all filed in no time at all. The county picked up law, and now they're searching through CCTV footage for the vehicle you're trying to hunt down. Thanks. He glanced up as Jenna came through the main office and headed his way. Joe and Carter are waiting in your office. Rowley and Rio are scanning CCTV files. Okay. Jenna headed for her office door. I wonder what they want. She bent to rub Duke's ears. He seems fine now. Kane chuckled. Yeah, he's much like me. Give him a cookie and he'll forgive anything. I'll try and remember that jewel of information. Jenna laughed and pushed the door open to her office. Chapter 19 Joe, Ty, how good to see you again. And who is this beautiful young lady? Jenna smiled at the young girl clutching a Boston Terrier on her lap. This is Jamie and Bo. Joe smiled warmly at Jenna. We're staying at the Cattlemen's Hotel for the fall festival. Nice to meet you, Jamie. I'm Jenna, 
and this is Dave Kane. Jenna smiled at the little girl. I've been looking forward to meeting you. Did you come in the chopper? I bet that was fun. I liked it fine, but Bo was shaking all over. Jamie frowned. He seems okay now. What happened to your face? Jenna touched her sore cheek. Oh, I just bumped it, is all. When I hurt myself, Mommy kisses it better for me. But adults don't do that, do they? Jamie gave her a wide-eyed stare. Well, Kane's dog gave my face a good lick before, so I'm good to go now. Jenna glanced at Ty Carter, sprawled in a chair, his trusty Doberman, Zorro, sitting beside him. The pair of them were a complete contrast. Carter gave the impression of a lazy cowboy, chewing on a toothpick, untidy blonde hair at his collar, wearing cowboy boots and a battered Stetson, while his dog sat upright, ears pricked, coat glossy, and ready for action. Ty, nice to see you. Are you all here for the festival? Nope. I'm here for some recreational pursuits. Eating, playing cards, or pool, and drinking. I might find time to go fishing as well. He looked at Kane. Do you have any vacation time due? I'd appreciate your company. Unfortunately, we have a homicide to investigate. Kane shrugged. We had planned to call you. Ah, no way. Carter held up his hands. I'm off duty, but Kalo is in the office if you need him to hunt down anything for you. I'll be happy to help. Joe leaned back in her chair. But I promised Jamie she could watch the parade. Jenna went to the counter and filled the coffee machine. We'll have time to run a few things past you later, when Jamie is asleep. Sure. Joe smiled. I was hoping to introduce Jamie to Shane's daughters. I think she'd get along with Anna, but I guess he'll be busy too. Jenna pulled out cups and the fixings. He will, but Julie will be taking Anna to the festival. She's very responsible, and they have a housekeeper who never misses a parade. Maybe you can tag along with them. I'll call and ask Shane later. Joe looked at Kane. Was it something in my field of expertise you needed to discuss? Yeah, it's complicated. Kane dropped into a seat and removed his hat. Like most things that happen around here. Well, Carter straightened and tossed the toothpick into the trash. He looked at Jamie. I have a hankering for a slice of Aunt Betty's peach pie. She has every flavor of ice cream. If your mom says it's okay, would you like to come with me and try some? Can I, mommy? Jamie grinned. Please, please, please? Sure, but don't be too long. Joe turned to Carter. You'd better grab a slice of that pie for me as well. She looked at Jenna. It's the best in town, right? Jenna laughed. It sure is. Let's go. Carter offered his hand to the little girl. We'll walk. It's not far, and the dogs need a run. They headed out the door. Okay. Joe leaned forward in her seat. What's happened? Jenna poured three cups of coffee and placed them on the table. She sat down and brought Joe up to speed with the Lori Turner case. Like Kane said, it's complicated. Hmm. Joe drummed her fingers on the desk. The cause of death confuses things. Strangulation from behind isn't upfront and personal, which appears to contradict the postmortem stabbing. Then we have the delay, Kane indicated to the whiteboard, which had been brought up to date by Rio in their absence. She was strangled and left in a sitting position for some hours, wrapped in plastic, and moved to the lowlands. We know she was stabbed in that location by the spatter pattern over the metal door to the old mine. Jenna chewed on her bottom lip. It doesn't fit any crime of passion I've seen before. That's because it's not. Joe sipped her coffee and thought for a beat. I'm wondering if this is a white knight murder. In what context? Kane looked puzzled. This type is the next step up from a man coming to a woman's need. This subject is really a subordinate to a dominant personality. He would see her as a goddess, someone he admires. 
He craves her favor and will do anything to please her, including being an accessory or committing murder for her. So we could have two killers working together. I have no doubt it's two people involved. Likely a male and female, but it could be two females. It's not unusual for two jealous females to hunt down women they hate. Joe stood and stared at the whiteboard. So are you assuming she was strangled by the subordinate and stabbed by the dominant? Jenna nodded. Yes, I think it's possible. We have a witness to say she took a ride in a car. And we're assuming from the time of death it happened sometime after that. Kane believes she was strangled inside the vehicle, but we can't ignore the fact she may have been attacked leaving the vehicle by a taller person. From the position of the marks on her neck, either is possible. So I can't discount the subordinate male. I'd say inside the vehicle. But I disagree with the idea the subordinate strangled her. Joe stared at the autopsy photographs. If a person isn't a killer and is ordered to take a life, the first kill would be clumsy. It takes four minutes to strangle someone to death. Sustained pressure is required or the victim regains consciousness. In that time, someone in this category would reduce the pressure. The cord would slip as they tried again. This isn't evident here. She looked at Kane. You've seen this before, surely. Yeah. Sometimes the victim wakes up and they have to strangle them again. Kane was on his feet, staring at the images. The marks on Lori's neck are from sustained pressure. So this was the dominant of the two. And I figure the attack was committed by the same person. Exactly. Joe stared at the postmortem wounds and nodded slowly. This is a frenzied attack. But what triggered it? She stared at the board. Any clues at the scene? Nothing. Kane sighed. As you can see, the entire area was swept clean. Okay. Let's wind it back to the actual murder. Joe turned to look at them. So why take her from the vehicle and sit her on a plastic sheet? Why sit her up? It would have been easier to lie her down. They obviously planned to move her, and a sitting body in rigor would have been difficult to move. Maybe that's why they waited overnight. Kane pointed to the images of the scene at the mine. They left very little trace evidence. They must know about forensics to some degree. You're missing my point. Joe leaned one hip against the desk. Why sit her up in the first place? A chill ran down Jenna's back as she contemplated the gruesome scene. Oh, Lord, they wanted her to watch them. That's my take on it. And the men's briefs pushed in her mouth is telling the world she's easy. Joe looked at Jenna. Okay, so fast forward to the morning they dumped her at the mine. What would trigger an attack to the face and eyes? Jenna rubbed her temples. She felt like she was back at Quantico again. It's jealousy. She wanted to destroy her looks and make her ugly. Not just that. Kane turned away from the board. The dominant killer believed Lori was still looking at them. Or looking at her subordinate. It was the trigger. That's what I believe, too. Joe sat down and reached for her coffee. Classic dominant with psychopathic tendencies. Subordinate follower with a white knight complex. I'd profile him with a dominating mother or grandmother in his life who runs him down all the time, and he sees the killer as a hero, someone who cares enough to kill for him. Kane dropped into his seat. Now all we have to do is find them. Remember the technique we discussed during interviews, Dave? Joe frowned. These types of criminals don't respect the people they hurt. You have to get down to their level, no matter how dirty it makes you feel. She sighed. It's sometimes the only way to get them to talk about what they've done. If they think you're of the same opinion, they'll often open up and boast about what they've done. It makes me feel like a pervert, speaking that way. Kane flicked her a glance. But it's a tried and true technique. Jenna squeezed his arm. After listening to psychopaths boasting about their kills, nothing you say in an interview will worry me, Dave. 
We use what works. And like Joe said, it's a recognized interviewing technique and not indicative of your thoughts. The phone buzzed, and Jenna reached for it. Hi, Shane. What have you got for me? She put the phone on speaker. We have a DNA match. The briefs belong to Wyatt Cooper. No match on the saliva as yet. Wolf cleared his throat. This seems very suspicious to me. Too darn obvious when every care was taken to leave the body clean. Jenna nodded. Yeah, it does. Joe is here on vacation. We're getting her take on the case now. Do you want to listen in? Hi, Joe. I'll call you later. I'm snowed under here at the moment. Wolf sighed. Jenna, I'm finishing up my report and checking results. I'll have them to you soon. Okay, thanks. Chat soon. Jenna disconnected. She looked at Kane. What do you think? It seems too much of a coincidence the DNA is a match to Cooper. Kane rubbed the back of his neck. If he'd been involved, why would he make sure there's no trace evidence and then leave a calling card behind? No one is that stupid. I have to agree, Joe nodded. It's as if they're trying to shift the blame to someone else. Jenna tapped her bottom lip, thinking. Cooper was jealous of Hughes. He admitted it, but nothing else fits. All this, Joe waved a hand toward the whiteboard, was triggered by jealousy. So you have a few options. I believe this is a female dominant and a male subordinate, but there is always a chance it could be one killer. But from what I'm seeing here, it's not likely for these reasons. If Cooper was pushed to a jealous rage when Lori went to Hughes instead of him for help, in my experience, a killer of this type would use rape as a punishment, rather than stuffing his briefs down her throat. And the killers have been so careful not to leave evidence. Jenna shrugged. It doesn't fit. She looked at Joe. What do you suggest? You'll need to hunt down any guys Lori was attracted to. Because one of them might be the subordinate and his girlfriend the killer. Alternatively, you need to discover if there was anything else to trigger an attack. Maybe something going on at school between the girls? Lori was on the cheerleading squad. Did she take another girl's place, for instance? Was there a rivalry there? She shook her head. Failing all of the above, we could have an opportunistic thrill killer who likes to keep corpses overnight and then mutilate them. In this case, the murderer would be male, for sure. But as there was no sexual contact, it would be unusual. But then, unusual is usual in Black Rock Falls. Chapter 20 by the time Joe and Carter had taken Jamie back to the Cattleman's Hotel, it was getting late. Jenna and Kane went over the case files, making notes, until Rowley and Rio emerged from the communications room. Both looked tired after reviewing the CCTV footage. Jenna looked up at them. How did you go? We found a similar vehicle traveling through town at nine on Saturday night. The feed is too distorted to make out a plate number or who is driving. Rowley sighed. The camera lens is dirty, or we have a wasp's nest in there. It was that bad. Nothing visible from the bank cameras, Miller's garage, or the gun store. Jenna nodded. Well, that's a shame. She glanced at her notes. Did you get all the paperwork for the law case over to the DA? Yeah. Rio nodded. The escort arrived at three to collect law. He's safely locked away in the county jail until his bail hearing. I followed up on Mrs. Law and her baby. She has collected her things from the family home and has settled into one of the safe apartments run by the Herbroken Wings Foundation. She will remain there for as long as necessary, but won't be returning to Blackwater. Relieved, Jenna smiled. That's good to know. How is your face? Rowley frowned at her. You're going to have a shiner. Jenna touched her cheek. I'm fine, thank you. She cleared her throat and brought them up to date with their interviews and Wolf's results. As you go past the Hughes' house on the way home, I was wondering if you could try and persuade Mrs. Hughes to allow you to take a DNA sample from Verna. I can try. 
Raleigh looked a little uncomfortable. I'm convinced Mrs. Hughes is a conspiracy theorist. Sandy has had a few run-ins with her. She isn't a pleasant woman and hates law enforcement. She may not allow me through the gate. Her place is posted, but I can try. Concerned over Raleigh's safety, she shook her head. Don't worry. If she's posted no trespassing signs, she's within her rights to defend her property. Going there at night without backup is out of the question. I doubt Verna is going anywhere. I'll drop by with Kane in the morning. She smiled at her deputies. There's overtime on offer for the festival. I'm calling in some help from Blackwater, but I'd like one of us to be on duty here until 10, 10.30, tomorrow and Wednesday. Walters has volunteered to take the rest of the week. He'll be taking over at 6. I'll do tomorrow, Rowley shrugged. I'll be in town anyway. Sandy wants to finish up at the house in town and make it nice for when Zach moves in. He chuckled. I can't stop her. Her mom says she's nesting, whatever that means. She's not happy at the moment unless she's cleaning or setting up rooms, and she ran out of things to do at the ranch last weekend. Jenna looked at Rio's puzzled expression. Sandy is Rowley's wife, and they're expecting. She gave up work last week and has been keeping herself busy, is all. Ah, I see. Rio smiled. Jenna waved him away. Okay, head off home. Maggie has already left for the day. We'll lock up. See you in the morning. She smiled at Rowley. Give my best to Sandy. I will. Rowley touched his hat and headed for the door. Jenna shook her head. I hope Sandy doesn't overdo things with the baby and all. I'm sure Doc Brown is keeping a close eye on her. Kane took his hat from the desk and ran his fingers down the center crease. You ever thought about having kids? Although taken aback by his question, Jenna didn't hesitate. Yeah, and I'm aware the clock is ticking. Why? Just asking. Kane seemed consumed by a fleck of cotton on his black Stetson. It's been great sharing everyone's kids, but it's not the same as having your own. Jenna tidied her desk. I couldn't agree with you more. That's good to know. Kane pushed the hat on his head and then bent to rub Duke's ears. A low rumble filled the room, and Jenna's attention moved back to Kane. Do you mind if we drop by Aunt Betty's for dinner? It's been a long day, and I'm famished. We still have to feed the horses, and I don't feel like cooking tonight. Sure. Kane collected his things and closed his laptop. I'll finish up filing my reports at home. Let's go. Jenna inhaled. The instant she stepped into Aunt Betty's cafe, its sinfully delightful aromas of dishes that were guaranteed to go straight to her hips made her glance at Kane, suddenly understanding his need to buy takeout to keep in his freezer. Living the long hours during cases, it was good to have something to pop into the microwave when they arrived home. The problem was, apart from a freezer filled with steak, Jenna didn't really have anything she didn't have to make from scratch. Aunt Betty's was busier than usual, with the tourists in town. As she edged around tables filled with people and made her way to their seats, she heard a bark. She turned to see Duke, sitting in front of the counter. She looked at Kane. Won't you look at that? He's ordering his dinner. He jumped the line as well. Kane grinned and sat down at their reserved table and picked up the menu. I could eat just about everything on here tonight. Pulled pork, honey-glazed potatoes, and peach pie for me tonight. Jenna removed her jacket and hung it over the back of the chair. I think I'll have the same, but I'll take the small portion. She laughed at his expression. I do get hungry, too, you know. After Susie arrived to take their order and placed a filled bowl for Duke on the floor, she smiled at them. What will you have tonight? After giving Susie their order, Jenna sipped a glass of water and leaned back in her chair. Mind if we talk about the case? Nope. Kane stood, removed his jacket and hat, and then sat down closer to her. We'd better keep it generic. We don't know who might be listening. With their backs to the wall and in the corner, the hum of conversation would cover any discussion. Jenna lowered her voice. 
I'm not sure about Wyatt Cooper. I know you figure he's not involved, but I still reckon we should talk to him about where he might have lost his underwear. I mean, could anyone have been in the vicinity of his laundry basket? That's a good point. Kane was leaning close, listening intently. There wouldn't be many places he'd be changing his shorts. He stared into space for a few seconds. A swimming hole, maybe. But he wouldn't take spares. Most would jump in the water and head home wet. Nothing came to Jenna. She'd had no experience with teenage boys. She thought back to the first time they'd spoken to Wyatt. He asked if you'd played football. He is on the team. Her face grew hot, and she looked away. Never mind. Out with it, Kane bumped her shoulder. That's the first time I've seen you blush. Come on, ask me. I know you want to. Jenna huffed out a breath. It's not something I really need to know, but it's a theory. She could feel her cheeks burning. When you practiced, or whatever, I guess you sweated a lot. Is it usual to shower and change clothes after training? It depends on how much gear you're wearing and the temperature, but yeah, I used to sweat right through. We practiced before classes, so we showered and changed. Before you ask, yeah, I changed my shorts. I figure most guys would. Kane smiled at her. I know the high school team practices before classes. Do you figure someone took his dirty laundry from his locker? He pushed a hand through his hair. Thinking back, most guys just stripped off and left their clothes in a pile on the bench. So, if your assumption is correct, we could be looking at someone who is either on the team or works with the team. Jenna nodded. I think we should ask him. She glanced at him. Although it's pretty embarrassing asking a 16-year-old about his underwear. Not if they were found stuffed in the mouth of his murdered ex-girlfriend. Kane shook his head. He has motive. He was jealous. He's admitted it and didn't like her talking to Hughes. The problem is, it's just too darn obvious that he's the killer. Unless I've read him all wrong. Well, Joe agrees with you. Jenna rubbed her temples. Personally, I figure divulging where we found his briefs will be giving away vital evidence, something only the killer would know, and I don't believe Cooper is stupid enough to leave a calling card. We need to inform him we found his shorts at the crime scene and watch his reaction. Kane shrugged. Although Joe did offer a variety of scenarios, I agree with you, and I'm leaning more towards Hughes and his sister. I have a gut instinct about a dominant woman being involved. And if Verna is as tough as they say, she fits the profile. Yeah, we'll need to see for ourselves. Sometimes people's reputations are unfounded. We'll head out first thing in the morning and catch her before she leaves for the parade. Jenna pulled out her phone and searched her files. Taking the possible football link into consideration, there's another name. Well, two names that Vicky Perez mentioned. We should follow up. The quarterback, Dale Collins, runs the refreshments kiosk for his aunt on training days, and both he and a cheerleader by the name of Marlene Moore were seen chatting to Lori before she disappeared. They might have some information. I'd like to know what they talked about that night. We don't have a link between them. Kane peered at her notes. Vicky just said Marlene is always hanging around Collins. That would be normal for a quarterback. They usually have a fan club. I'm thinking out of the box, Dave. We'll hunt them down after we've spoken to Verna. Jenna smiled as the food arrived. Ah, oh, this looks good. Thank you, Susie beamed. Enjoy. I'll send someone back with a pot of coffee. Do you figure she'll give you her recipes? Kane grinned at her. Nah, don't ask. Jenna frowned. Why? Is it because I'm hopeless at cooking? Nope. I think they'd be locked away in a vault. Kane chuckled. And by the way, I happen to like your little idiosyncrasies. They make you special. Chapter 21 Tuesday 
The internal clock inside Kane's head woke him at five. He pulled on his workout gear, a sweater, and sweatpants, and then headed out into the misty morning to do his chores. As usual, Duke tagged along, and Pumpkin, Jenna's black cat, was sitting on a hay bale waiting for them to arrive. He took the horses out to the corral and stood for a second to admire the view and enjoy the horses. He placed one boot on the new gate he'd purchased from the Crazy Iron Forge out of Blackwater and relaxed, allowing the murder case filling his mind to seep into oblivion for a few minutes. The need to complete his chores and head into work tugged at him, and with a sigh, he turned to walk back to the barn. He paused mid-stride at a sound coming from inside. Both the dog and cat were around his feet, and the ranch was like Fort Knox. No one crossed the boundaries without setting off an alarm. He heard the scrape, whine, plop again, and edged alongside the wall before turkey peeking around the door. He barked out a laugh at the sight of Jenna mucking out one of the stalls. Morning. Hey. Jenna leaned on a pitchfork and smiled at him. It's cold this morning. I figure I needed to loosen up before we worked out. She glanced at her watch. I want to be leaving here by 6.30 to be sure we catch the Hughes family at home. Kane picked up a shovel and scooped and tossed manure into the wheelbarrow. Have you decided anything about the saliva sample found at the crime scene? Yeah. Jenna had moved onto the third stall. I sent it to Bobby Kalo to run through the DNA databases last night, but unless our suspect has been in trouble with the law or served in the military, we won't find a match. Kane kept up a steady pace and didn't stop to look at her. They have access to all the DNA databases, including the ones people use to discover their family tree. We might not get a direct hit, but we might get a close relative. I hope so. Jenna broke open a bale of straw and shook it out inside the stall, before repeating the process in the next one along. We need something to go on, and it seems to me whoever stabbed Lori with the screwdriver left the saliva. They were in a rage and could have been shouting obscenities, for all we know. Spittle can fly out all over when someone is angry. Kane rolled the wheelbarrow out to the compost pile behind the barn to empty it and then followed Jenna to her ranch house. It was their normal routine. They washed up and then completed a brutal workout before showering and eating breakfast. Their uniform had changed a little since their stint as FBI consultants. The need for unencumbered movement had become clearer with each arrest they made. They both now preferred regular jeans, a t-shirt, and a sheriff's department jacket. Jenna would wear blue jeans, an open neck blouse, and had swapped her duty belt for a less cumbersome holster and a jacket with more pockets. He preferred black and wore his Glock in a hip holster with his badge displayed on his belt. The change hadn't as much as raised an eyebrow with the townsfolk, and although Rowley had asked the question, Jenna had informed him as sheriff and deputy sheriff they could wear what they pleased. They rolled through town at close to seven and arrived at the Hughes home a little after. Kane gave his siren a blast and went up the driveway with his wigwag lights flashing. He turned to Jenna. I don't want them taking pot shots at us. If they have nothing to hide, they shouldn't be so worried. She turned to him. They must have had regular visits when they were in the foster system. Kane approached the house, doing a visual scan of the area, windows, and doors for any sign of a shotgun pointed in their direction. A dusty old Chrysler sedan was parked under the trees out front. Yeah, but that was some time ago, when Verna was a kid. Things have changed around these parts since then. The door opened, Corey stepped out, and the screen door slapped shut behind him. Kane buzzed down his window. Is it okay with your ma if we have a chat? Sure. Corey's brow wrinkled into a frown. What's up? Kane climbed out and waited for Jenna to join him. He followed her onto the porch step. Can we come inside? Ma, the sheriff is here. Corey turned away from the door. Can they come in to speak to you? 
He turned back and stood to one side. Straight ahead. She's in the kitchen. Verna is cooking breakfast. She has the parade this morning and can't be late. We won't keep you long. Jenna tucked a DNA test kit under one arm and followed Corey down the hallway. The house smelled like a chicken coop, and Kane had to maneuver his way around piles of junk. The adoption would never have been approved if the house had been in this state. He assumed since the adoption had gone through and her husband had walked, Mrs. Hughes had become a hoarder. He stepped over empty bean cans and piles of newspapers. The mounds of trash showed evidence of rodents. The place was a mess. He eased inside the kitchen. Here, it seemed the kids had made a space to cook and eat, but it was minimal. Kane waited in the doorway and batted away the flies. I guess you know we took a sample of Corey's DNA to eliminate him from the investigation into Lori Turner's death. Jenna waved a test kit. We weren't aware Verna was adopted, so we're here to ask if we can get a sample from her as well. We're testing all of Lori's friends. I was never Lori's friend. Verna scowled at them over one shoulder. She used her family's money and her pa's position to get on the cheerleading squad. The rest of us had to earn our place. I see, but all the same, we'd like a test if it's okay with your ma. Jenna looked hopefully at the woman sitting at the table with a cigarette held between her fingers. Nope, I won't give my permission. Mrs. Hughes shook her head. He got no right to take my boy's DNA. Now he'll be on the FBI's database for life. Kane cleared his throat. He's old enough to give permission, ma'am. And the sample would only be a problem if he's planning a life of crime. And from what I'm seeing, he's hardworking and good at his job. He's a janitor. Mrs. Hughes rolled her eyes. He cleans up trash. Maintenance is a very respectable profession. Jenna looked horrified. He is responsible for all the auxiliary staff working at the school. He does a great job. He's a no account, just like his father. Mrs. Hughes waved a hand around the house. He don't like it here. <laughs> he wants to find his own place and leave me to fend for myself. He figures I'll just stand by and let him take Verna with him. She took a long drag on her cigarette. It just ain't gonna happen. Okay. Jenna exchanged a meaningful glance with Kane. Before I go, have you seen anyone hanging around the school or the cheerleaders? Someone who isn't on staff? There is one guy. Corey buttered a slice of toast and stood leaning against the counter to eat it. The girls call him Stalker Stan, Stan Williams. He hangs around some, takes photos, and asks them for dates. He shrugged. I mentioned him to Mr. Turner, being as he's a shrink and all, and asked him if I should report him. Stalker Stan, I mean. He figured he was harmless enough. Kane frowned. Does he get too friendly? At all? Not that I'm aware. Corey chewed slowly. No one mentioned anything. Any idea where we can find Mr. Williams? Jenna took out her notebook and pen. How old would you say he is? Dunno. Thirty, maybe? Corey pushed more bread into the toaster. He lives in a room over the general store, acts as their security overnight, and drives the school bus. When was the last time anyone drove the old Chrysler sedan? Kane looked around the faces in the room. I drove it last Saturday night to practice and once to go to the store. Verna shrugged. Ma don't go out much. Kane looked at her. Did you give Lori a ride on Saturday night? No. I had to pick up a cherry pie from Aunt Betty's for Ma. Verna glared at him. I'm not allowed to give people rides in Ma's car. I'm waiting to eat here. Mrs. Hughes stabbed out her cigarette in an overflowing ashtray on the table and glared at them. 
Enough with the questions. Sure. Thank you for your time. We'll see ourselves out. Jenna turned and waved him away. Outside, Kane took a few deep breaths and turned to her. How do people live like that? It's a fire hazard. And now I feel like I have cooties. Jenna pulled out a pack of wipes from her pocket and washed her face and hands. She thrust them at him. Here, don't get in the truck until you wash your hands. That place needs to be condemned. She stared at him. Is there anything we can do? Kane shook his head. Nope. If they had garbage piled up outside, the council could order them to clean it up. But inside, they have the right to live in squalor if they choose to. He wiped his hands and face before slipping behind the wheel. It's a shame we can't eliminate Verna. Now I've met her and seeing the circumstances she's living in, the pair of them make a very interesting couple. She's strong and dominant, and Corey is constantly belittled by his mom. We can't discount them as suspects. You have echoed my thoughts, Jenna shuddered. But brother and sister? Kane turned the beast around and headed back to the highway. They both know they're not related, and he admires her. It's possible. Let's see if we can hunt down Williams. Jenna was checking the databases on the mobile digital terminal. I can't find anything apart from his background checks to become a school bus driver. He looks clean. She checked out a few things and then leaned back in her seat. The kids have a school-free day for the parade today, so no school bus. He might be at home. It's worth a try. Kane shook his head. I'm not happy with a 30-year-old guy hanging around 16-year-old girls and asking them on dates. He sounds like a creep to me. I'm surprised the parents haven't complained. Jenna huffed out a sigh. I guess as he's been cleared to drive the bus, he's not a danger. Astonished, Kane shot her a glance. The background check would have been basic. Maybe this state, maybe just this county. He could have committed offenses elsewhere, or he's just not been caught yet. He crawled along Main and finally parked a short distance from the general store. I'd like to know what his interest is in young girls. Usually men aren't quite so brazen. They'll go watch the football to sneak a peek at the cheerleaders, but showing up at the practice, he's up to something. I can feel it in my bones. So do you want to take the lead in the questioning and lean on him a bit? Jenna pushed on her hat and smoothed her hair behind her ears. You might make him talk. Yeah. Kane smiled at her. I'd like that. Chapter 22 It was busy in town, with everyone getting organized for the parade. People milled around, setting up tables to sell a variety of goods, from flags to cookies. Excitement hummed through the excited chatter. The fall parade was a big event for Black Rock Falls, and like Jenna, the day for everyone had started at dawn. She walked beside Kane to the general store, and they went round back. The store was very old, and one of the first buildings to be constructed in town, the apartment, once the residence of the owner, was accessed by a long wooden staircase. As she climbed the creaky steps, Brown paint flaked off the handrail like confetti. She stepped with care. I hope this staircase will take your weight. It's not rotting. It's just old, is all. Kane examined the handrail. A lick of paint and a few nails, and it would be fine. He touched her shoulder. If this guy is remotely involved, I might have to get down to his level, same as I did with Hughes, and talk dirty to make him believe I'm just like him. Yeah, I agree. Getting a suspect on side and making them believe you're of like mind lulls them into a false state of security. Get at it and say what you must to get the information we need. Jenna reached the landing and thumped on the door. Mr. Williams? Sheriff's Department? The door opened and a handsome man wearing jeans and a sweatshirt peered at Jenna with a half smile. His brown hair hung over one of his dark brown eyes, and he gave her the once-over before straightening at the sight of Kane. Jenna cleared her throat. 
Mr. Williams? Yeah, that's me. Stan Williams. He frowned. Is there a problem, Sheriff? We're investigating the murder of Lori Turner. Kane spoke over Jenna's shoulder. May we come inside? Sure. Williams stepped back, allowing the aroma of freshly brewed coffee to flow outside. The place is a mess. There's not much room up here for me and my hobby. Jenna peered around the surprisingly light room. It was clean and tidy, but one wall was crammed with photographs of cheerleaders. A bench held photography paraphernalia, and a light screen was set up in one corner. You have a photography studio up here. It's a passion, Williams smiled. I'd love to capture you. You have remarkable skin. The camera will love you. Noticing the hard line of Kane's mouth as he examined the images of young women on the wall, she shook her head. Ah, uh, thanks, but no thanks. I hate having my photograph taken. I don't like looking back and realizing how old I look now. Photography isn't my thing. You need to talk to Kane. He's always taking shots. She turned to stare out the window to give Kane the chance to take the lead. What a great view of the mountains. Do you invite the cheerleaders here to have their photographs taken? Kane turned to look at him, with his back to the window. Yeah, sometimes. Williams stared at the images as if entranced. There's so many memories here. I can't take any of them down. I bet. Kane dropped his voice into a confidential tone and led Williams to the far corner. He pointed to an image. She's pretty. How did you get her up here alone? They're comfortable with me. I'm part of the furniture. Williams leaned closer to Kane and chuckled. <laughs> you should see the ones without the uniform. Interesting. Maybe you could show me sometime, when I'm not with the boss. Kane moved along the wall, staring at the images. Sure, I'm free after six most nights. Williams smiled. I never believed that people of like mind would be in law enforcement, but I have friends from all walks of life, lawyers, judges, and doctors, would you believe? Yeah, the job doesn't reflect taste, does it? Kane smiled. Look at me. You'd figure me for a beer man, and yet I prefer a glass of Pinot Noir. I learned long ago not to judge a book by its cover. Williams chuckled. But we still have to watch our backs. Yeah, we sure do. Kane raised his eyebrows. Did you photograph Lori Turner? Lori? Williams smiled. Yeah, but not here. I take photographs of the squad at the gym and at games. But her father would cause trouble if I asked her to come here. He winked at Kane. He doesn't understand. So are the photos for your own pleasure? Or do you have a group of like-minded enthusiasts? Kane moved slowly along the wall, leaning in to examine the images. Great action shots. They're very professional. No wonder the girls want you to take their photographs. Oh, I supply images for the yearbook and local newspaper, plus any promotions the school wants to do. I offer them free of charge, of course. Williams ran a finger over the face of one of the girls. So many favorites. I could never choose just one. Could you? They do say variety is the spice of life. Kane looked at him. Tell me about Saturday night. You were at the gym taking pictures of the cheerleaders. Did you talk to anyone in particular? I talked to everyone. Williams went to his computer. I got some great shots. Do you capture everything? The spectators, for instance? I sure do. <laughs> Williams laughed. Some of them are in my private collection. As we're of like mind, can I have a copy of the file? Kane pulled a thumb drive from his pocket. I'd like to see who's there. He handed him the stick. I guess. Williams looked taken aback. I haven't had time to edit the file. What about the sheriff? I don't want this getting into the wrong hands. That's okay. Kane smiled at him. 
The sheriff is only looking for crowd shots to verify who was watching the practice. He leaned in close, unless you have anything else to share. Jenna stared in amazement as Williams obediently pushed the drive into his laptop and transferred the files. She moved away from the window and walked slowly toward them. Where did you go after the practice? I came home. Williams indicated to his laptop. I downloaded my files and sent a few emails. Around 10, I walked down to Aunt Betty's for pie and coffee. It's busy in town on Saturday night, and I like to be with people. Jenna nodded. Did you speak to anyone in particular? I spoke to strangers, mostly. Tourists, I guess. William smiled at her. I'm a sociable guy. What's your ride? Kane looked at him. Is it one of the trucks parked out back? Yeah, the GMC. Williams checked his watch. Is that all? I want to grab breakfast at Ed Betty's before the parade. Jenna headed for the door. Thank you for your time. Do you have a card? Kane wasn't following her. I'd like to drop by sometime. Sure. Williams pulled one from his wallet and handed it to him. I'll look forward to it. Jenna headed down the steps and walked to the truck in silence. She climbed in and waited for Kane to slide behind the wheel. Don't tell me. We came here to investigate a suspect in a murder and stumbled over another darn pedophile ring. She thumped her fist on the seat. In my town? Again? Maybe, maybe not. He still had time to commit murder, although he doesn't drive a Chrysler sedan. Kane pulled the truck out of the space and they crawled up Main to the office. We'll see what's on the file, and if he's sending out underage images to a bunch of friends over the internet, including law enforcement, judges, and lawyers. It may just be talk, but if it isn't, we'll turn it over to the FBI. Jenna leaned over the back seat and rubbed Duke's ears. He had been fast asleep and yawned explosively. Okay, but that means you'll have to drop by his place and sit there while he shows you disgusting images. If there's anything suspicious on the file he gave me, I'll go with Carter, then we have the FBI in at the get-go. Kane shrugged. He can turn it over to the sex crimes unit. Then it will be Josh Martin's problem. Okay. Jenna rubbed her temples. I'll need to write this up and plan our next move. At least all the cheerleaders will be together for the rest of the day. They have the parade, and then there's a photo shoot with the football team. So they'll be occupied as a group until at least midday. She glanced at her notes. I'd like to have a chat to Dale Collins and Marlene Moore to see if they recall anything from their conversation with Lori on Saturday night at the gym. The best time to find them will be before they get organized. After the parade, they'll split up and go see the attractions around town. Kane stared out the window. Some of the parents will be here as well, if we need statements. Almost everyone has a day off today apart from us. Even the bank is closed. Jenna pushed open the door. I feel as if I'd done a day's work already. She checked her watch. It's only 10.30. You go ahead. Kane stared down Maine. I'm going to grab something from the cake stall before everything is sold. He hurried away with Duke bounding behind him. Shaking her head, Jenna walked up the steps, through the glass doors, and went to greet Maggie on the counter. Anything for me this morning? Nothing new, no, but Rowley and Rio have organized the Blackwater deputies in your absence. She wrinkled her brow. We have four from Blackwater and two of Crenshaw's boys coming in from Luann for the duration. Rowley reserved rooms at the motel for them some time ago. And some of them are willing to work double shifts if you feed them right and give them a bed for the night. Relieved, Jenna smiled. The mayor insisted I get all the help I needed for the festival to free us up for the Turner investigation, so agree to anything they need and send the accounts to his office. The front door opened and Sandy walked in, smiling broadly. Hey, Jenna, Maggie! I'm afraid Rowley isn't here. He's out organizing deputies. Jenna waved her toward her office. I'm just about to brew a pot of coffee. Are you allowed to drink coffee? Yeah, sure. Sandy rubbed her swollen belly. We're doing just fine, she smiled. 
I didn't want to miss the parade, and I'll be going to see my mom later. But while Jake is on duty here, I'm going to finish up at the old house. Jenna filled the coffee pot, collected cups and the fixings, and set them on her desk. You sound like you're missing work. Me? Sandy shook her head. Not at all. The ranch keeps me busy. Now we have chickens and horses to tend. It is remote, though, and I'm a town girl. But I have the dog to keep me company. Dave was saying he's going to help Jake beef up the security. The house is safe enough, but with the baby and all, I'd like a perimeter fence alert as well. Jenna nodded. Well, once we've solved this case, Kane's your man. And I'm sure if Shane's not busy, he'll be over to help as well. That would be good. Sandy took the cup Jenna offered. Thanks. I hope I'm not holding you back from working. Jenna sat down and shook her head. No, we're just taking a few minutes to regroup. And it's been a long time since breakfast for Kane. He'll be here soon with armfuls of cakes to keep himself going. She grinned. I had no idea men ate so much food. Yeah, since Jake built the gym out at the ranch and with his visits to the dojo, he is always hungry as well. Sandy chuckled. But he sure looks good. She sipped her coffee. Who looks good? Kane came into the office and dumped bags onto Jenna's desk. Mmm, coffee. He went straight to the counter to pour a cup and then dropped into a chair. Jenna pushed the cream and sugar toward him. Girl talk, she winked at Sandy. What did you buy? Everything. Kane pulled a bag toward him. You can have anything you like, but the banana cream pie is mine. I hear Jake's voice out in the hallway. Sandy finished her coffee. I'll have a quick word with him and be on my way. Thanks for the coffee. She gave them a wave and hurried out the door. Jake has everything under control here. Kane dug into his pie with a plastic spoon and sighed in delight. The cheerleaders are in a group in the park and waiting for the football team to arrive. We can catch them before they start the parade. It doesn't begin until 12. They'd planned for 11.30, but they have some problems with the sound system at the podium set up for the mayor. So we have plenty of time. Good. Jenna scanned her notes. I want Rowley and Rio checking the MVD for green Chrysler sedans in the area. Jenna stared at the mound of food on the table. It smelled wonderful, but she wasn't hungry. She peered into a bag containing individual caramel pecan pies. Maybe just the one. Chapter 23 He found his girl in the crowd of people heading into town and pulled her into an alleyway. Are you sure you want to do this? Becky seems like a nice girl. A nice girl, huh? His girl's mouth turned down, and her eyes flashed with anger. Of course, they're nice to your face, but she wants to make you look like a jerk. She's probably asked one of her friends to follow you to take pictures to plaster all over her Facebook page, to prove a bet or something. You're a trophy to them, nothing more. All you guys are. They don't care about your feelings. They just want to bring you down. They're just like your ma. She leaned into him. I'm the only one you can trust. We have secrets between us, and they bind us together. I'll never treat you bad. But if you love me like you say you do, then you'd care that they're mean to me. My life would be better without them. I can't kill them without you. A shiver of excitement curled in his belly. It was like dropping down real fast on a roller coaster. She always made him feel the same rush, as if he'd been strapped to the front of a freight train. Okay. Are you sure no one will be at home? I don't see any for sale signs outside. Are you sure it's empty? I'm sure. I've been by a few times and it's empty. The people that live there leave the key in the same place each time. I figure it's for the handyman. Or someone to get in to fix up the place. She grinned at him. I've been inside. It's perfect. There are new mattresses on all the beds still wrapped in plastic. 
There's cleaning products in the laundry. We can clean up real good before we leave. He nodded, trying to show enthusiasm, but he liked Becky. She didn't seem at all nasty, and he'd gotten on well with her. Becky had been very enthusiastic about a date with him and had kissed him passionately under the bleachers. He hadn't dared mention the kiss. His girl would go crazy and stab Becky a hundred times. He could handle watching the girls being strangled, but the stabbing made him sick to his stomach. He lifted his girl's chin and looked at her to convince himself he couldn't live without her. I'm worried. Killing someone in the middle of town with so many people around that someone will see us leaving. We'll leave by the back door. It's surrounded by trees, and I already have a key. They left two hanging in the lock, and I just took one. I'll put it back later, and I left the other one on a nail beside the door. I'll kill the power when I go inside, so bring a flashlight. Take Becky upstairs. There's a bedroom on the left at the top. It has a big closet, and I'll hide in there. Get her with her back to the closet, and I'll do the rest. <laughs> she giggled. Then we can strip her off and make her sit and watch us. We'll clean up. I'll return the key, and we'll slip out the back door. You can burn her things like before, and no one will know a thing. She can stay there until they sell the house, and by the time they find her, we'll be hunting down Vicky Perez. He wiped the back of his hand over his mouth and shuffled his feet. The sheriff has been talking to everyone who was at the gym on Saturday night. Do you figure she suspects us? Us? She barked a laugh. No, of course not. We're just as sweet as pie and much smarter than they think. They'll be looking for an old man, a pervert, a sex offender. Everyone knows Lori was easy, and so are the others. So it will show up they were playing around. She grinned. In any case, they'll be hunting down the guy who owns the briefs and blame him. She ran a finger down his cheek. Don't forget, we need more of them. So select carefully. By the time we finished, the sheriff will have so many suspects, she won't know what to do. She pouted at him. I want to stay here with you, but we have to go, or we'll be missed. I'll walk around the back of the building and come out behind the bank. We can't be seen together. She went on tiptoes to kiss him. I'll see you tonight. She scampered away down the alleyway, turning out of sight. He stared after her a mixture of excitement and dread crawling over him like an ant's nest. He pushed all doubt from his mind and imagined Becky propped up against a wall, naked, eyes staring into nothingness, watching him with his girl. All of a sudden, sunset couldn't come fast enough. Chapter 24 Jenna looked at Kane over her desk. Hand over the thumb drive. We might as well scan the images while we're taking a break. We won't have time. Kane collected the remaining purchases and took them to the small refrigerator in Jenna's office. We'll have a walk to the park if we want to speak to Collins and more. Maine is closed off for the parade as of five minutes ago. Okay, I'll upload them to our files and we can look at them later. Jenna finished her coffee and sighed. My cruiser's parked around back. We could take the back roads. It would be quicker to walk. Kane washed up the cups and turned them upside down on the sink. Hey! Carter knocked on the door. You planning on eating tonight? Jenna smiled at him. Yeah, but we have to head home and tend the horses. Plus, we have an ongoing murder case. Well, you have to eat, and I'm inviting you both to join me. Joe and Jamie at the Cattleman's Hotel restaurant for dinner at seven. Carter shook his finger at Jenna. Don't tell me you have nothing to wear. I know you both keep numerous changes of clothes here at the office. It's lovely of you to ask, but we can't. Jenna shook her head. We're still hunting down suspects. 
We just don't have the time to go back to the ranch and then out to eat at the Cattleman's Hotel. It takes an hour to get a meal there. Yeah, you do. Carter rested one hip on the edge of her desk. I'll go tend your horses. If you let me take your cruiser, I'll be able to get through the security and be back here in time to shower and change for dinner. He glanced down at Duke. I'll even let Duke into your backyard. He likes me. He'll come. No worries. Jenna raised an eyebrow in question at Kane, and he shrugged. She looked at Carter and nodded. Well, I guess we do have to eat, and it means we'll be in town if we're needed. She took the cruiser keys out of her desk drawer and tossed them to him. We'll see you at seven. You sure will. Carter looked at Kane. I'll drop by and collect Duke around five. That should give me plenty of time. I'll leave him with Maggie. Kane smiled. He doesn't like the fireworks, so we'll be more than happy to be at home tonight. He looked at Jenna. We need to go. Jenna stood and pulled on her jacket. I'm right behind you. She followed Kane and Carter out of the office. Maine had transformed into a promenade filled with people, kids, with balloons and cotton candy. Brightly colored bunting hung across the road, and from every storefront in town, the sidewalk was packed with stalls selling everything imaginable, and townsfolk and tourists moved from place to place in swarms like bees attracted to the bright colors. Loud music blared over speakers attached to streetlights, interspersed with announcements from the festival committee. They walked by a hastily built podium for the mayor to address the crowds and passed the vans used by local media stations. She kept close behind Kane. His size was an advantage in a crowd, and people parted to let him by as he strode along. If she kept directly behind him, she had a clear path. Sheriff or not, her small frame was lost in a sea of people. She sidestepped a mother with kids trailing behind her holding hands. Their mouths ringed with the unmistakable red of a toffee apple. One small girl had the stick from her cotton candy stuck in her hair. Excitement thrummed through the town, and everyone had a smile for her as she walked by. They finally reached the park, and Jenna stared in amazement. Football teams stood at one end, waiting to head to their float. A marching band was warming up with an awful assortment of sounds, and the cheerleaders fussed over their uniforms and pom-poms, some practicing moves or doing pointing and giggling. Inside the perimeter of the park, it was easier to move, and Jenna pulled out her phone and located the images of Collins and more. She showed the screen to Kane. Normally, I'd say split up, but I'll get lost in the crowd. I think it's best we stay together. The cheerleader squads are close, so we'll see if Marlene Moore is with them. Kane peered over the top of his sunglasses and narrowed his gaze. Darn, they all look the same. Jenna headed in the squad's direction. Then we'll ask. The girls will know her. She walked up to the first girl she came to and held out her phone. Have you seen Marlene today? Yeah, she's over there with Vicky, the girl pointed. Standing next to Becky. Jenna thanked her and led the way around the group of girls. As they approached, Becky and Marlene stopped talking and nudged Vicky in the ribs. Jenna pasted a smile on her face and pulled out her notebook and pen. Marlene Moore, may I have a word with you? Sure. Marlene shrugged and followed her out of earshot of the others. I believe you were at the gym on Saturday night speaking with Dale Collins and Lori Turner. Can you remember what you were talking about? Maybe. Marlene stood with her pom-poms on her hips. I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but Lori was a flirt. She had been talking about seeing Wyatt watching her in the crowd, so she dragged me over to speak to Dale. He only opens the kiosk for us during practice, and I figure he gets tired of girls hitting on him all the time. She looked away with a bored expression. His aunt usually runs the kiosk, but she doesn't think it's worth her time to open it for a couple of hours for us. So Dale opens it. Really? Kane gave her a quizzical stare. Don't all the members of the football team have admirers? Yeah, but they only go with cheerleaders. Marlene touched her hair. 
Is that all? Jenna shook her head. Can you recall anything at all that was said? Did Dale make a date with Lori or plan to meet her? No. He hasn't asked anyone to the fall festival ball as yet. Marlene rolled her eyes. He likes to keep his minions waiting, I guess. Jenna smiled. So he's not your type? Dale? <laughs> Marlene laughed and looked up at Kane. I prefer tall, dark, and handsome. She pointed in the direction of a tall, blonde teenager. As you can see, Dale is the opposite. Okay. Jenna folded her notebook. Thank you for your time. She handed her a card. If you can think of anything else, call me. Sure. Marlene walked away, and Jenna saw the card flutter to the ground. The football team is getting ready to head to the float. Kane hustled through the cheerleaders. Jenna ran behind him, and they reached the football team as they congregated at the far end of the park, in the dog-walking enclosure. She made out Dale Collins's blonde hair and headed in his direction. As she made her way through the team, Kane moved ahead of her and led him over to the fence. She smiled at the confused look on the young man's face. You're not in any trouble. We want to know if you remember speaking with Lori Turner last Saturday night in the gym. Yeah, sure I do. Collins frowned. It's terrible about Lori. Have you found who killed her yet? Jenna shook her head. Not yet. What did you talk about? The specials. Collins stared at his shoes. I asked her how her truck was going. I teased her a bit about it being a guy's ride. She laughed. The next thing, Marlene came over and told her Wyatt was spying on her again. And Lori went back to sit with the squad. He lifted his gaze to Jenna. I didn't see her after that. I have to clean the kiosk after the break. I count the money and lock it up. I went home soon after. So you don't hang back to chat to the cheerleaders after practice? Kane was watching him closely. Nah. Collins grinned. After the game is the best time, when everyone is all pumped up and wanting to celebrate. I try and keep as far away from them as possible during the week. I need to keep my grades up, and they're a distraction. He glanced over his shoulder as the decked-out float pulled up at the curb. I gotta go. He turned and jogged away. Jenna looked up at Kane. I wanted to have a chat with Wyatt Cooper as well. That we'll have to wait for later. Kane was peering over the heads of the crowd. As soon as the mayor does his speech, the floats head down Main and do a turnaround at the showgrounds before coming back. We'll catch him then. As they headed back to the sidewalk, the crowd squashed in around Jenna. A sensation of claustrophobia gripped her, and she pulled on Kane's arm to stop him disappearing into the throng. Dave, I'm getting swamped back here. Hang on to my belt. We'll cross Maine before the parade starts and take the back road to the office. Kane turned and grinned at her. Unless you want to piggyback. Rolling her eyes, Jenna twirled her fingers to make him turn around. The belt will be fine. She gripped his belt and they moved through the crowd. And the next thing she found herself inside Aunt Betty's cafe. What are we doing here? You have enough cakes to feed an army at the office. Yeah, but as we were passing, I thought I'd drop in while everyone is outside watching the parade. He grinned at her. We can work anywhere, and it's a nice quiet place to sit and go through the image files. We can access them on our phones, and I know you don't like eating cake for lunch, so you'll be able to get something here. Jenna sniffed the air. And you smelled the aroma of chili wafting down the sidewalk. She shook her head. Okay, you win. She waved him to a table. Chapter 25 They spent the next couple of hours going through a ton of images of cheerleaders. Jenna had to admit some of the photographs bordered on unsavory. But then some people would look at them as action shots of a cheerleading squad's routine. It was all in the eye of the beholder. She looked up wearily from her phone. Find anything suggesting Williams is a pedophile? 
Nope. But if I had a daughter, and I thought men were sharing some of these shots, I wouldn't be too happy. The routines happen in a split second and are innocent enough, but William somehow makes them indecent. Kane rubbed his chin thoughtfully. I'm still not convinced there's not more to him than meets the eye. He is obsessed with cheerleaders, and it could easily lead to murder. He opened his hands. Thinking out of the box here, if he lured one to his apartment and she refused his advances, strangling her to keep her quiet is something that I've seen before. Jenna closed the files and looked at him. That will be hard to prove. I did notice he had a set of pom-poms on his desk, but assumed they were props for his photographs. But now we know Lori's are missing from her backpack. It throws suspicion on him. We'll need to get closer to Stan Williams and see how he ticks. Kane leaned back in his chair. I'll call Carter and convince him to come with me to pay Williams a visit tonight, after dinner. You'll be wanting to chat with Joe, I'm sure. Jenna nodded. It's going to be the only time we have free. If Rio and Rowley find any Chrysler sedans in town similar to the one that gave Lori a ride, we'll be spending the rest of the week hunting down their owners. She stretched and glanced at her watch. We'll go find Wyatt Cooper and then head back to the office. I guess you'd better grab something for Duke, as Ty is going to take him home soon. See, you do care about my dog. Kane tucked his phone inside his pocket and stood. I knew he'd grow on you eventually. Laughing, Jenna stood. I've always liked Duke. I mean, who wouldn't love those sad brown eyes? I've just never been in a position to have pets. It's a responsibility I couldn't risk taking, like marriage and kids. Life is different now. Yeah, we still face dangers, but we have reliable people around us who care. I'd never had that before. For me, friendship and loyalty came at a price. Yeah, well, that's all behind us now. Kane smiled at her. All I have to worry about is murdering psychopaths. Jenna dropped a pile of bills on the table and headed to the door. Look, the football team float is pulling up at the end of the park. Let's have a little chat with Wyatt Cooper. If we can make it through the crowds, we'll be able to catch him before he heads off. Although the crowds had eased a little, the football team had scattered leaving only a few of the players in small groups chatting. Jenna spotted Dale Collins with a small group of friends and headed in his direction. She noticed his smile vanish as she approached. Sorry to bother you again. Does anyone know where we can locate Wyatt Cooper? He took off. Collins shrugged. He said he had something to do later. He sure don't seem too upset about Lori. He frowned. At least the rest of the team will be at her funeral to pay our respects. What do you mean by that remark? Kane's eyes narrowed. There's no plans for a funeral at this stage. Did he say something? Yeah. He told us he wouldn't be going to her funeral. Collins straightened. He didn't give a reason. Why don't you ask him yourself? I'll be sure to. Kane's gaze moved over the others watching the interaction. We have a team of deputies from other counties here for the festival. So don't try to buy liquor at the showgrounds again this year. We don't want to find any of you boys locked up in the cells come morning. We'll be sure to remember that, deputy. Collins turned his back and walked toward another group of players. Annoyed by Collins' arrogance, Jenna stared after him. That went well. I figure we have someone flying under the radar. Kane rubbed the back of his neck. The problem is none of the people we've spoken to have raised any red flags. With the exception of Williams. He waved a hand at the marching band following the cheerleaders into the park. Someone here knows something. One of these kids knocked Lori's phone out of her hand. And I'm convinced whoever did it is involved with her murder. Seeing the way the students gathered together in groups, gave Jenna pause to consider what Kane had said. She shrugged and followed him from the park. Maybe not. She thought back to her time at school and turned to him. Say one of them disliked Lori and was part of a prank to have her walk home. There may have been a small group of them involved. 
One of the guys disables her truck and one of the girls bumps into her. Look around you. Everyone is chatting in groups. I remember this happening when I was at school, in the parking lot, on the way home, waiting for the bus. We'd chat for ages. Yeah, I remember. Kane removed his hat and scratched his head before replacing it. Why? If I recall, when we spoke to Hughes, he knew just about straight away that Lori's phone was toast, and he just placed it in a plastic bag and he locked up and went home. Yeah, that's what I remember. Kane stopped walking and turned to look at her. Where's this leading, Jenna? Like a jigsaw puzzle slipping into place, Jenna smiled at him. Well, he said he didn't see anyone in the parking lot. He said it was empty and dark when he drove by. Where was everyone? Why weren't there some kids still hanging around when Lori couldn't start her truck and decided to walk home? Maybe because Lori was inside longer than he remembered. Kane shook his head slowly. There's no way a group of kids could commit a murder like that. Do you think they're all involved? No way. One of them would flip out with the stress. Unconvinced, Jenna stared at him. Look back in history. Cult figures influenced people to do terrible things, even commit suicide. Right now, I'm open to any suggestions. We have a young girl brutally murdered in the morgue and practically no evidence, and what we do have was probably planted. When they arrived at the office, Jenna found Rowley at the front counter and Rio updating files on the computer. As Kane headed into her office to call Carter about visiting Williams later, she checked her watch and then leaned on the counter. Bring me up to date and then go home and take a break before your next shift. Sure. Rowley turned his iPad around to show her. These are the seven green or gray Chrysler sedans of around the same model in town. We know about the one that Mrs. Hughes owns and track down five. Three of these are in use and two are in barns and haven't been driven for years. The last one is in the used car yard here in town. It's been there for about three months. He pointed to the three names on his list. We visited all three of the owners and all have an alibi for Saturday night. They were all at home with family members. And all three owners are in their late 60s. No one else drives their vehicles. Jenna nodded. Good work. She lifted her chin and sighed. So that really leaves the Hughes' vehicle. She slapped the table. You'd better get along home, but I'll be in town for a while tonight, so you don't have to be back until 6.30. I'll be at the Cattleman's Hotel while Kane talks to a suspect with Carter. Thanks, Rowley smiled. I'll have time to drop Sandy at the old house before I come back. That's good. Jenna sighed. Now I'll try and figure out a way I can get a search warrant to seize the Hughes' vehicle to see if Wolf can find any of Lori Turner's DNA inside. I might have that sorted. Rio walked to her side. Verna has admitted to driving the vehicle on Saturday night. She didn't like Lori, and her brother was one of the last people to see her alive. Add to this, we believe the killer had an accomplice who knocked the phone from Lori's hand, and Corey had plenty of time to disable her truck during the practice. I figure we have probable cause. Impressed, Jenna smiled at him. Write it up and see if you can catch a judge to issue a warrant. I'll be in town tonight so you can get on home, too, once you get back. Jenna. Kane walked out her office and went to her side. Carter had Kalo run Stan Williams through the sex offenders database, and his name came up in a sealed FBI juvie document. We can't use it against him, but it was a heads up. Seems that as a 15-year-old, Williams was caught molesting five-year-old girls at a birthday party. Chapter 26 Sandy Rowley gave Jake a kiss goodbye as he left their old home in town. Go! I'll be fine. I have my thermos and cookies if I get hungry. When I'm done here, I'll watch the fireworks from the front window. Stay inside and call me if you need me. Rowley touched her cheek. I'll be at the office. 
She gave him a little shove. Go! Jenna will be waiting for you. I'll see you soon. Close the door behind me. Rowley moved down the stairs, turning to watch her before he hurried to his SUV. He'd insisted on checking all the rooms before he left. Since she'd found out she was carrying their child, he'd been super overprotective. But she didn't mind. Having such a kind, loving husband was a wonderful gift she valued greatly. She glanced around the house. It was as neat as a pin. But the delivery guys had left papers and footprints everywhere. The house belonged to the sheriff's department, willed to them by a deputy killed on duty some years ago. To make the inside nice, Jenna had replaced the three mattresses, bed linen, and drapes. Jake had painted the interior during a six-month slow period after the melt, and now it was ready for the new occupants to arrive. Zach Rio and his twin siblings would be moving in the following weekend. She moved from room to room, making sure everything was spick and span. The hectic day, watching the parade and visiting her mother, had exhausted her. The house had an empty, cold feel about it, since they'd removed all their possessions. A radio would have been nice to break the silence, as hearing the creaks and whines of the old house was putting her nerves on edge. She finished her chores, stowed away the cleaning utensils, and leaned against the kitchen counter, deciding what to do to pass the time. She checked her watch, willing the time to go by faster. Jake wouldn't be by to collect her until at least 11. He said his shift finished at 10.30, but he'd spend time chatting with whoever took over the next shift. And by the time he arrived home, he was usually about an hour later than expected. She poured a cup of hot chocolate from her thermos and went upstairs to the back bedroom. Her favorite stuffed leather chair was sat in front of the window. She could watch the comings and goings in town. She curled up, finished her hot chocolate, and must have dozed off to sleep. Something woke her, and disoriented in the darkness, she glanced around for some moments to get her bearings before staring at her watch. The digital readout told her it was a little before nine. The lights in the hallway had been on when she came into the room, but she'd sat in darkness to best observe the view outside the window. Perhaps a bulb was out. She stood to turn on the light. She flicked the switch off and on. Nothing. A wave of panic surged through her at an unusual sound from downstairs. She'd lived in this house for over six months before moving to the ranch, and she could identify just about every noise in the old house. Heart pounding, she slid back into the room and pressed her back against the wall. The creak came again, and a slight jingle, like the sound of keys. If it had been Jake or even Jenna dropping by, they'd have called out and turned on lights, not crept around. Someone was in the house. The sound of footsteps came again, like boots on the polished floor. In blind panic, Sandy searched her pockets for her phone. She could see it in her mind's eye inside her purse on the counter beside the thermos. How had someone gotten inside? Jake had insisted she take the key to the front door with her rather than return it to its place above the door. She placed one hand on her swollen belly. If the intruder moved into a room, she could slip down the stairs and go for help. Footsteps moved through the kitchen. Cabinet doors opened and closed. Terrified. Sandy's breathing came so fast, she feared someone would hear her. The noise came again, and then a familiar sound, a snap, like someone pulling on surgical gloves. Cold shivers ran down her spine as the footsteps came closer, each step precise and taking the stairs in a controlled pace, with no rush. They know I'm here, and they're coming to hurt me. Without a weapon, Sandy had nothing to use to defend herself. She moved deeper into the shadows and held her breath. 
She recognized the squeaky hinge of the door to the first bedroom at the top of the stairs and the sound of someone sliding open the closet door. Now was her chance. She slipped out the room and with her pulse thundering in her ears, crept along the hallway. Just as she reached the open door to the first bedroom, the old grandfather clock in the hallway downstairs struck nine. Terror had her by the throat, and sweat beaded on her brow as she dashed toward the stairs. Footsteps thundered behind her, and out of the darkness, someone grabbed her hair, tearing her scalp. The next instant, pain shot through her face as her head slammed into the doorframe. Blood ran into her eye, and she staggered back the way she'd come, feeling along the wall, trying to get away. A loud clang broke the silence and rang through her head in a wave of suffering. She fell to her knees and rolled into a ball and played dead to protect her unborn child. Only heavy breathing came, and then someone took her by the feet and dragged her inside a room. A boot scraped past her, and she squeezed her eyes shut tight. She could sense someone leaning over her and held her breath. Lungs bursting, she waited for them to leave the room. The door slammed shut as they ran back down the hallway. Sandy swiped at her eyes, nauseous and dizzy. Alone in the dark, the sky outside the window lit up in a streak of green. The firework display danced across her vision before everything went black. Chapter 27 Nervous excitement thrummed through Becky Powell as she stepped inside the library to meet her date. She spotted him at once, leaning casually against a bookcase, flicking through pages of a book. He raised both eyebrows at her and walked out into the hallway. She followed him down the back stairs, and he waited for her at the fire door. She smiled at him. Has she followed you again? Yeah, but she didn't see me leave. He pulled her close to him. I found a place we can go. It's nice and private. Did you bring your pom-poms? Becky grinned. Yeah, they're in my backpack. I'm guessing you want me to do a routine for you. A real private routine? Something like that. He cupped her chin and kissed her. We'd better slip away before she notices I'm missing. Leave your ride here. I have a truck out back. Keep to the shadows. And when you get inside, duck down so she can't see you if she happens to look out the window when I drive by. When his hands closed around her fingers, she nodded in silent agreement. Nice and quiet. He pushed open the fire door and led her outside. Heart. Thumping with anticipation, Becky followed him into the cool night. She hadn't had too much luck dating anyone of late, and stealing him from under the nose of one of his admirers made it all the sweeter. She couldn't stop grinning as she hurried around the edge of the building and climbed into his truck. As she hunkered down, he took off slowly, and she could see the streetlights on Main blink past above her. Where are we going? Not far. But we'll have to sneak into this place. He glanced down at her. It's an empty house, but they've left all the furniture. It will be real comfortable for us to get to know each other. Becky giggled. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> I've never been on a date like this before. Are you sure no one is going to come by? Certain. He slowed the truck and pulled in under a tree. Remember, not a sound and we stick to the shadows. I don't want the neighbors to see us or they'll call the cops. I came by earlier and unlocked the back door, so we're going to sneak in there. He handed her a small lantern from the back seat. Once we're inside, I'll use my flashlight to get upstairs, but when I close the drapes, we can turn on the lantern. It will be real cozy. Becky's heart raced as she followed him through the long shadows up a driveway and down a small pathway to a door. They moved inside, and she smothered a giggle. The house smelled of furniture polish and clean air, as if it had been well-aired. 
Following the flashlight beam, they headed upstairs, and as they climbed higher, the hand holding hers became damp. She liked that he was nervous being with her. And sneaking into an empty house with him in secret made it so special. At the top of the stairs, he turned into a bedroom and quickly closed the thick drapes. The flashlight blinded her for a few seconds as he aimed it at her. Hey, drop the light and I'll turn on the lantern. Give it to me. He took the lantern from her and set it on the nightstand, but didn't take the light from her eyes. Show me your pom-poms. Blinking, Becky slipped her backpack from her shoulder and unzipped it. She pulled out her pom-poms and setting her backpack at her feet, waved them at him. Now will you lower the light? Nah, you promised me a special routine. He indicated to the bed. I wouldn't want your clothes to get all messed up. Your folks will know we've been making out. Why don't you slip out of them for me? Becky's face grew hot. You first. I'd love to, he chuckled. But then I'd have to put down the flashlight. We'll take turns. Come on now. Wriggle out of the skirt and top before I lose interest and take you home. He tilted his head and looked her up and down. I went to a ton of trouble to organize this just for you, Becky. I figured we wanted the same thing. I thought you were special. You think I'm special? Becky dropped her pom-poms and removed her top and skirt. Better? Much. He trained the flashlight on her. Kneel on the floor and fold up your clothes. I don't want them getting messed up. When you're done, you can watch me. Confused, Becky stared at him. You're starting to creep me out. Did you think I'd just jump your bones? I don't treat my girls like that, Becky. He shook his head. I like things slow and easy. I'd like to be your last boyfriend. So let's make our first date one to remember. He seemed so sincere. Could he be asking her to go steady on their first date? She couldn't believe her luck. She fell to her knees and quickly folded her clothes. A swishing sound came from behind her, like a whisper of a breeze. But she ignored it, engrossed in looking at him. I worry about the girl in the library causing trouble. Are you sure she didn't follow us? I'm sure. I'm only interested in you right now. He shrugged. If she bothers us, I'll deal with her. Becky smiled up at him. What will you say to her? I'll tell her I love her more than life. The flashlight blinded her. Surprised by his reply, she squinted at him through the glare. What did you say? The floorboards creaked behind her, and something dropped over her face to settle on her neck and tightened. Slammed down with a knee in her back and her face pressed hard against the wooden floor, she fought for air. Help me! As she opened her mouth, gasping, he stepped forward and bound her hands with tape. Bewildered, she gaped at him. Why are you doing this? Because I like you. He grabbed her chin, and it makes my girl angry. Cloth hit her tongue. She gagged, shaking her head to dislodge his grip. But he wound tape around her head, covering her mouth, and then stood back, aiming the flashlight into her eyes. She gaped in disbelief as he leaned casually against the nightstand, as if enjoying the show. Using her last ounce of strength, she rolled, trying to unseat the person behind her. The cord slackened, and she flipped to her feet. She'd done the move a hundred times as a cheerleader. She sprinted for the door and ran down the stairs, tripping over and rolling to the bottom. Battered and heart pounding with fear, she staggered to her feet and bolted for the back door. Light spilled through the kitchen window like a beacon to show her the way. She could hear them behind her. Footsteps ran in all directions, hunting the hallways. She reached the back door and turned around, using her bound hands to search for the handle. Fingers slipping, she turned the knob and the door swung open. Cold air hit her bare flesh as she dived outside, narrowly missing a hand trying to grab her. 
In terror, she ducked away and dashed along the narrow path, heading back along the way they'd entered the house. She'd seen lights in nearby homes and increased her pace. The person behind her was gaining. She could hear heavy breathing and footsteps on the gravel. The edge of the building loomed, highlighted by a street lamp. In a few more paces, she'd be out on the road and sprinting toward another house, people, and safety. She rounded the side of the house at speed, and a figure stepped out of the shadows. Strong hands grabbed her and spun her around. The person who chased her moved into the light, and she recognized her at once. She wanted to scream, but the gag was filling her throat and making it hard to breathe through her nose. Take her back upstairs. The young woman's lip curled. I haven't finished with her yet. Terrified of what was to come, Becky aimed a knee at her dream date's groin, but he sidestepped and hoisted her over one shoulder and then headed back inside. Blood rushed to her head as he carried her up the stairs, but when he dropped her on the floor, she kicked out. She wanted to inflict as much damage as possible. She flipped her over as if she weighed nothing, dragged her back to her knees. And an instant later, the horror began again. Terror gripped her as the cords slipped around her neck, sliding into all.